All right, what's up, guys? My name is Cole, and this is Practical Faith. Um, thank you for joining me for tonight. Let me make sure everybody's muted. Awesome. Um, so this tonight, uh, we're going to debate uh, a topic that I've been interested in for a while. And uh, so I'm excited to have some very capable debaters on each side of tonight's discussion. Um, they're going to be discussing open theism, and the specific thesis of tonight's debate is, does the Bible teach that God knows the future exhaustively? All right, so this debate's going to be a little bit different than your typical debate, so it's not going to be opening, rebuttal, cross-examination. Um, we are going to do an opening, and then uh, we've broken down the debate into six subtopics. Uh, each side has chosen three topics, and the other side already knows what the topics are. And those are going to be discussed kind of in an open format for 15 minutes with one side leading the conversation. And then I'm going to introduce the subtopics uh, before we start each 15-minute session. And if that didn't make very much sense to you, uh, that's okay. You'll kind of get it as we go. Um, but I'm going to briefly introduce tonight's debaters. So let me get them on the screen. There we go. Um, so representing open theism, we have Will Duffy. He is the owner and uh, contributor of opentheism.org. And he's back for the second time on my channel. Uh, joining him is going to be Chris Fisher. He's the author of the book, God is Open, and also runs a podcast and a website by the same name. So great to have you guys on. Uh, some really good representatives of the open theism position. Uh, representing the Arminian position, we have Dan Chapa. 
He is a Southern Baptist and member of the Society of Evangelical Arminians. Uh, Dan's also been on the channel before debating Romans 9, which is really interesting. Uh, you guys could check that out if you haven't already. And Dane Von Ace is going to be joining him. He's ordained elder in the United Methodist Church and pastor at Sango United Methodist Church. There's a good chance I didn't say that right. Uh, but I've uh, known Dane from a distance for a while uh, through Facebook. A uh, really good guy. Watch some of his discussions also online. Um, so all of their information is going to be in the description below. So you can check out their channels and their websites. Um, they've agreed to a 14-minute opening for each side. I'm going to set the timer at 15 minutes. And then if I miss anything in their introduction, they can add it. Uh, I said before, like if they want to just give their kids a shout out, do that. Uh, you have an extra minute to kind of play with, um, and then we're going to transition like from one to the other. We are going to have a question and answer time after the debate. It's going to be kind of a long debate, um, so it's going to be about two hours before we get to the question and answer time. Um, so you can ask a question in the comment section beforehand. Make sure you tag me at Practical Faith. But if they answer it in the course of the debate, I'm probably not going to re-ask the same question in the question and answer time. Uh, so it might be better to wait till the end. But if you're not going to make it, just go ahead and, and uh, tag me there. Um, also, if you um, send in a super chat, that will make me really happy. <laughs> uh, this might be the first live stream where I've had super chats available. So um, I haven't got one yet. That would be really cool. Uh, and it also put your question to the top of the list. Uh, if you don't give a super chat, maybe you can help the channel by subscribing. If you don't subscribe, then just give this video a thumbs up. If you don't do that, then uh, feel free to troll in the comment section. Uh, whatever, whatever you want to do, we're just glad that you're here. And uh, a little bit later, after this is up for a little bit, I'm going to try my best to put a uh, comment to the top of the comment section. Uh, with timestamps for those of you uh, who would like to skip around a little bit. But I would encourage you just to watch the whole thing. All right. So the classical theism side is going to go first. And so once I get these buttons figured out and you guys can unmute yourselves, I'm going to go ahead and put you on. And then Dane, I believe, is going to start with the first seven minute and then transfer it over to Dan. Okay, uh, Dane, you are good to go. When you start talking, I'm going to go ahead and put up your timer. Awesome. Thank you, Cole. The question before us today is this. Does the Bible teach that God has exhaustive knowledge of the future? I respond to this question with a resounding yes. God does know the future perfectly because God is a God of infinite knowledge. The Bible says this explicitly in Psalm 147.5. We read that God's understanding is infinite. The word infinite literally means limitless or endless. For God to have infinite knowledge, then we must recognize that his knowledge cannot be added on to. Therefore, God would have to know everything, even the future, because if he was ever adding knowledge, even if it was knowledge of the future, if he was ever adding on to it, then the Bible couldn't say his knowledge is infinite. Only finite things can be added on to by definition. The Bible also says on multiple occasions that God knows all things. The disciples confess that they realize Christ knows all things, John 16, 30. And this is in the direct context of Jesus predicting their future persecutions to them and how they will receive the Holy Spirit in the future. After he tells them all these things, they say, we know you know all things. Peter also confesses that Christ knows all things, John 21, 17. And in 1 John 3, 20, we hear the same words, that God knows all things. On top of this, Paul teaches us in Colossians 2, 3, that all knowledge and wisdom is hidden in Christ. The authors of scripture do not qualify this usage of the word all. The way they use it is simple and straightforward. All means all. Also, and this is very important to highlight, in scripture, God speaks of his foreknowledge of the future as one of the key, chief, and defining characteristics of his deity. This is one of those attributes and characteristics which sets him over and above all false gods and over all humans and over all creatures. We read in Isaiah 41, 22 through 23 of God mocking, deriding, and chastising the false idols because they cannot predict the future. They are clueless about the events to come. 
hear these words of the Lord and hear the sarcasm even in his voice. God says to the false idols, let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods, do good or do harm, that we may be dismayed and terrified. God is saying, hey, if you're truly a God, tell us what's going to happen in the future because God himself can do that. And God tells us he can do this. He tells us he has this future knowledge. Here, Isaiah 42, 9, God says, behold, the former things have come to pass and new things I now declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them before they happen. God tells us of them. Or consider Isaiah 48, 3. I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. Or one more, Isaiah 48, 5. Therefore, I told you these things long ago, before they happened. I announced them to you so that you could not say, my images brought them about, or my wooden image and metal God ordained them. God is saying, what separates me from all these false gods? What is one chief and key way you can know me? As different than these false gods, God is saying, I know the future. That's one of my defining characteristics. And Jesus also uses this as one of his defining characteristics to present his deity to the disciples and to us. Jesus says in John 13, 19, that they will, he tells the disciples all these things beforehand about his betrayal and his passion and all that. And he says that he tells them these things beforehand so that they will believe he is the Messiah. Jesus says in John 14, 29, I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. Why should they believe that he's the Lord? Why should they believe that he's the Messiah? Because he's telling them the future before the future happens. Another important consideration is that the Bible contains many, many, many God-given prophecies in which God details precise human actions well in advance. And I'm just going to list a handful for you, but there are literally thousands upon thousands of these. God talks about how, uh, through Samuel, how Saul will encounter men who will be holding certain objects. God says uh, what these men will say to Saul, that they will even salute him. This is in 1 Samuel 10, 1 through 7. God prophesies the historical conquest of men like Cyrus and knows him by name even before he's born, Isaiah 45, 1. God knows the movements of Israel's military enemies in advance, Jeremiah 37, 6 through 10. Jesus has knowledge of Judas's future betrayals, John 6, 64. God had prophesied even the amount of money that this dirty job would uh, pay for the betrayer in Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. Jesus prophesies his own death and resurrection and the people involved in handing him over and arresting him, Mark 8, 31 through 33. He prophesies Peter's denials and the timing of them being before a cock crows, John 18, 13 through 27. Jesus prophesies Rome's political movements and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Again, those are just a small batch of thousands upon thousands of examples that could be mentioned. God also speaks of having knowledge of things that to our human perception seem random, but they're not random at all because God knows them uh, well in advance. He knows the words that humans will speak before they speak them. Psalm 139, 16. He knows the specific individual before he or she is born, knows the, their DNA and knows them completely before they're born. Jeremiah 1, 5. He even knows how lots will fall in the laps of men, Proverbs 16.33. But here's what I think is most important. God knowing the future is actually important to the message of the gospel. You see, in open theism, the cross of Christ was not plan A. It was one of many potential plans. The future was open. Christ didn't have to die even before the foundations of the earth in the open theist system. But we know from scripture, the Bible tells us repeatedly that the cross was always God's plan. It's the pinnacle of all history. It's the climax of redemption story. And it was planned even before times eternal. It was the ultimate expression of God's grace, love, and justice. This is what history is all about. That's why the cross split time in two from before Christ and in the year of our Lord now. So listen to this. God had planned for the sacrifice of Christ to be the pinnacle and climax of history even before times eternal. Second Timothy 1, 8 through 10. 
God had chosen to save believers in Christ and by the shed blood of Christ before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4 through 7. God had foreordained before the foundation of the world what has now been revealed to you, 1 Peter 1, 20. And God, who cannot lie, promised before eternal times the gospel message now revealed and preached, Titus 1, 1 through 3. This shows exhaustive knowledge of the plan of salvation even before the world was made. This shows the gospel message that would be preached even in God's mind before the world would, was made, the election of believers before the world was made. And it does indeed entail that God had knowledge of the fall and of sin and the necessity of redemption before the world was made. And so to conclude, I submit to you today that God knows past, present, and future perfectly. God does not learn. Indeed, no man can give him counsel, Isaiah 40, 13 through 14. God just knows. He has eternally known all things. He eternally knew my opening to this debate even before he created the world. In fact, Acts 15, 18 puts it simply and sublimely, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. And one last brief comment, I will say that I think the danger of open theism is that they fall into the trap of Psalm 50, 21. God says in frustration, you thought I was just like you. Open theists make God more like a man by saying he has no knowledge of the future, just like a man would have no knowledge of the future. And with that, I would like to pass it to my brother, Dan Chapa. Thank you. Um, so scripture specifically predicts that Israel is going to be in Egypt uh, for 400 years. It predicts uh, Judah's uh, captivity for 70 years. It predicts the destruction of Jeroboam's altar um, 300 years in advance, specifically indicating that Josiah by name is the king that will carry out this destruction in 1 Kings 13. Isaiah foretells Cyrus by name that he's going to defeat the Assyrians, allow the uh, Israelites to return to Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple. All that's 200 years in advance uh, of Cyrus's birth. Obviously, there's some predictions about Christ, his birth in Bethlehem, the slaughter of the infants, the flight to Egypt, um, Christ's uh, crucifixion, the nail-pierced hands, the casting of Lot for his clothes, that his bones won't be broken, that he's going to be buried in the tomb of a rich man, um, and that he's going to be uh, in between two thieves. Um, Christ uh, foretells Peter's three denials, Peter's repentance after those three denials, Peter's death. God knows the full number of the days of our lives. Um, Daniel is full of prophecy, but just in Daniel chapter 11 specifically, um, Daniel prophesies in the first year of King Cyrus, uh, king of Persia. He predicts the three kings that will come after Cyrus, followed by a fourth. Then the fourth king, who's likely Alexander the Great, um, dies young, and then his sons were murdered. Daniel predicts this along with the fact that the kingdom would be divided into four parts. That's Daniel 11.4. And then... Um, he describes this, uh, predictively roughly 155 years of warfare between the uh, Seleucids and the Ptolemies, um, with specific focus given to the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes, and um, the that he's the unrightful heir to that throne. Um, specifically, you know, some people might say, well, you know, that that doesn't necessarily include free will actions, but it actually specifically says that it does. In Daniel 11:36, it says, "And the king shall do as he wills; he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak abominable things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for that which is decreed shall be done." Now think of Joseph and all his predictions, Isaiah, Daniel, Christ in the Olivet Discourse, the book of Revelation. Revelation 13.10 says, if anyone is to be uh, taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain by the sword, with the sword he must be slain. That's a Hebrew idiom for certainty, that repetition formula that's uh, uh, about certainty. Think of all the other prophecies in Revelation. Think of the two witnesses, Armageddon, the beast, the satanic rebellion. Um, think of uh, in Deuteronomy that prophets whose predictions de didn't come true were to be executed. And then, of course, we have the uh, the fact that uh, God cites prophecy as proof of his divinity. Um, Dane covered Isaiah, but just to touch on Isaiah 43 um, and 9, it says, Which of their idols have ever foretold such things? Which can predict what will happen tomorrow? Where are the witnesses of such predictions? Who can verify they spoke the truth? Let me repeat that last part. Who can verify that they spoke the truth? That should be our standard in, in, in determining uh, truth and prophecy. In contrast, in verse 12, it's, uh, the Lord says, it is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed. 
Um, so there's really no way to explain these things other than God knows the future exhaustively. There's no other um, integrated system of beliefs that's going to get uh, to the network of all the choices that are necessary to fulfill all these prophecies that came true. Um, and the thing is, if one future free action can be foreknown, then they're possible to know. And if they're possible to know, then God knows them all. Otherwise, his understanding is not infinite, like the scripture declares. So what about the open theist claim that they take the straightforward reading of Old Testament narratives? In some sense, in narrative theology doesn't work that way. You can't uh, take an isolated detail outside of the whole picture. And here's what I mean. Think of the book of Esther, right? So we, uh, as we move through the story, we share in the twists and turns and the drama and the exaltation and the suspense and all the excitement that goes through the story. But when we look back at the whole story, at the whole narrative, that's when we understand what God was doing all along and all the little diff uh, different details. And that's the way narrative theology works. So let's take a look at the uh, classic open theist proof text and put it back into its narrative to see how it fits. So let's take Moses's intercession. Um, so this is after the golden calf incident and Moses uh, does intercede and it's a very dramatic moment. It actually seems scary for us that all this is going on, right? And let's take uh, some specific details in ex Exodus 32, 10. Now there, therefore let me alone that my anger may burn hot against them. This is God talking to Moses and I may consume that them and th in order that I make make you a great nation. And then in verse 14, after Moses intercedes, the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken to bring about his people. So that's a classic open theistic proof text. Um, but this judgment that God gives is contingent on Moses not interceding and the people having not yet repented. It's an appropriate attitude when those things haven't happened yet. But the command that's given to Moses is directly connected with the purpose clause, that my uh, wrath may burn. Therefore, it's an offer to Moses, and it's contingent upon his response, and it's an invitation for Moses to res respond and be part of the story. Um, now, God knows the outcome uh, because um, Moses was a Levite. We see that in Numbers 14, and the kingship had been given to Judah. So it's not really an option for God to wipe out everybody except Moses or even Moses himself because uh, Moses offers his life. Um, so the, this text, for starters, in no way presents Yahweh as proposing evil only to be restrained by Moses. And the reason why we know that for sure is in Genesis 15, God tells Abraham, um, so after God has given Abraham some promises, he uh, says to split the um, some animals in two, and then a flame passes uh, between them. And uh, he says uh, in Hebrews 6, it says that God uh, made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater. He swore by himself saying that he'll bless them. And by two immutable things, which is impossible for God to lie, we have the same consolation. So um, Moses was given a test of choosing God or um, himself. And, but God knew this intention, and by repenting, it's not through God learning new information, because if he, if he wasn't, literally, God is putting his own reputation, his promises on the line, even his own life on the line. So there's no way that's, that's the case, that he's learning new information. Rather, God, um, the human situation has changed, and God's uh, actions re respond in a fitting way to that changed situation. Awesome. Thank you guys for that opening. Um, and then I don't think I asked you guys, uh, Chris and Will, who would like to go first? I'd okay. be myself there, my friend. <laughs> All right, man. I'm going to put you on. And then whenever you are ready, you can go ahead and start and I'll put up your timer. All right. Excellent. Uh, I want to speak briefly about the title of this debate tonight. Does the Bible teach that God knows the future exhaustively? Now, I love this title because this debate's not about what I believe. I mean, I don't even care about what I believe. This uh, debate's not about what Will Duffy believes. Boring, right? Although Dane and Dan, they're great guys from, from all, from all uh, perceptions that I have of him. We're not here tonight to learn what they think about God. Tonight, we're here to examine what the Bible actually teaches about God's omniscience. Does the Bible teach that God knows the future exhaustively? The Bible is notoriously absent this category of thinking. This is uh, so true, it made it into Christine Hayes's Yale University lectures on the Hebrew Bible. Uh, there's a scene in which she's remembering sometimes some interactions with fundamentalist Christian students, and she gives a little laugh, and she's like, the character Yahweh in the Bible uh, he repents. It's just a fact of the text. She elsewhere points out that omniscience is a later addition that's not in the Bible. 
in the Bible, God is surprised by human actions and even learns about human beings. Within the Bible, one might find claims, as we've already heard, that God knows some things about the future. Yeah, in the Bible, God does know some things about the future. I know things about the future. People in the text within the Bible, they know things about the future. Uh, so that's not very good evidence. Or within the Bible, you might find phrases like, God knows everything. Typically, these, these uh, phrases are in the context of God watching the world. Now, watching the world is learning. So if you, you watch to know everything, you're gaining information, that's learning, that's open theism. But no one's going to find anything in the Bible suggesting anything close to exhaustive foreknowledge of all events, which is actually what we are debating tonight. So let's talk about what this entails. Really, this is just known as classical omniscience. Classical omniscience states that God has innate, ungenerated, non-discursive, eternal, unfalsifiable knowledge of all propositions, past, present, and future. It has to be innate because if God gains knowledge at some point, then God does not have exhaustive knowledge. God, gained omniscience means open theism is true. It has to be ungenerated because God's knowledge can't be dependent on outside things. Dependent knowledge is acquired knowledge. Dependent knowledge means open theism is true. It has to be non-discursive. Now, discursive thinking is when one thought leads to another. Well, I'm going to go over here, then I'm going to go over there, or, or interacting with someone and considering the things that they're saying. Thinking. Thinking is discursive knowledge. If God thinks... His data set, his knowledge set changes. If God thinks, open theism is true. God's knowledge can't be falsifiable. What he knows must come true. It can't be false. So God can't know something and that thing not come true. If that does happen anywhere in the Bible, open theism is true. Now, throughout the Bible, we get a very different picture of God's knowledge. It tells us how God knows what he knows. God has acquired omniscience. God knows because he sees, Hebrews 4.13, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God knows because he does. Isaiah 46.10, we heard this verse earlier in, that, in, their, in their speech. Uh, no, it says, declaring end from the beginning, from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. I will accomplish my purpose. God knows because he does. It's, it's a learned omniscience. God knows because he predicts. Psalms 139.1. This is another verse we've already heard. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. Skipping down to verse 4. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, oh, Lord, you know it altogether. God searched. He knows. Now he can predict what David's going to do. He learned about David. God knows because God tests. Deuteronomy 8.2. You shall remember the whole of the Lord your God, has how he has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you testing you to know what's in your heart, whether you to keep his commandments or not. Any one of these by itself proves open theism is true. Just assuming the Bible is consistent and true. Any single example of God learning is enough to prove that God does not have exhaustive knowledge of the future. The reverse is not true. God knowing one thing about the future does not mean God knows all things about the future. That's a fallacy of composition. But let me repeat this again. Any one of these, if got any one of these ways that God learns, if that is accurate, what it's describing, it proves open theism is true. Any single example proves that God does not have exhaustive knowledge of the future. And the reverse is not true. Let's talk about other bad evidence. General omniscience claims. You've heard tonight already. It's like, oh, the Bible says God knows all things. Well, yeah, people come across this phrase and they're like, oh, this phrase must mean my special idea of what omniscience is. Uh, but the Bible set uses that phrase all the time in, in regards to people. So it says, uh, believers, believers know all things. 1 John 2.20, they understand all things. Proverbs 28.5, they're filled with all knowledge. Romans 15.4, they know all things perfectly from the beginning. Luke 1.3, King David knows all things on earth. 2 Samuel 14.20, the writer of Ecclesiastes has seen all the works under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.14, no secret can be hidden from the Prince of Tyre. Ezekiel uh, 28.3. This is just normal language applied to normal human beings. Something in context needs to draw us to what, what, what the phrase actually means. We can't just point to the, these phrases and say, oh, this is my special meaning. Prophecy. That, that's a second other bad evidence. Prophecy, just the way prophecy functions, it proves open theism is true because prophecy generally is designed to fail. God wants to tell people his current intentions based on current circumstances. And the goal of this is to get the people to change. And then God in turn 
changes. Malachi 3, return to me and I will return to you. Within the Bible, prophecy is subverted all the time. Sometimes it's subverted because people change. Sometimes because God changes. Sometimes because other factors change. Sometimes we don't even get a reason why the prophecy fails. Sometimes the prophecy comes true generally, but not in exact detail. We already heard about the 400 years of captivity. Oh, for 400 years of captivity. There's, there's a book by Stephen Roy. He lists uh, 4,000 prophecies involving free will. And uh, this is one of them. Uh, what he doesn't do is he doesn't show where these things actually come true. So he's like, oh, there's a prophecy that the Israel is going to be enslaved, sojourners, oppressed for 400 years. But we read over in Exodus, they're actually in Egypt about 430 years. And if we read Exodus carefully, the impression was only like about 80 years. And then you got to add on another 40 years of sojourning in the wilderness. So, you know, give or take uh, 470 years or 120 years, if you're including the oppression, uh, it's close enough to 400 years. Uh, it's close enough works. Uh, Israel's supposed to be in captivity for 70 years. It's actually 60 years, so close enough. The Bible tends to do this with prophecy all the time. It uses prophecy loosely. Prophecy gets fulfilled in spirit rather than in detail, as one would expect in open theism. The very nature of prophecy is flexible and open. There are multiple ways God can fulfill any prophecy, and we see God change his mind within the Bible as how to fulfill that prophecy. Categorically, it's evidence for open theism, not against it. One classic example is uh, Israel. God has this eternal promise to Abraham. Uh, he tells he tells Israel, he says, I could kill you all. And, and how can I do that and still fulfill my promise? John the Baptist tells us he could raise new children of Abraham from these rocks because that's, that's the message of the Bible. God's more innovative than the lim limitations that we want to impose on him. We say, how can this prophecy be fulfilled unless my specific ideas come true? No, God is innovative. God is creative. God can raise new children of Abraham from these rocks. I'm also going to give a little prediction of myself. I, I'm, I'm going to give a little prediction. I think Will Duffy here tonight, he's now going to show how open theism is a consistent message throughout the Bible. The Bible from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, contains hundreds of verses that overwhelmingly show that the future is open, not settled, and therefore not exhaustively known to God. A settled future would mean even God himself lacks the ability to change it, and as we will argue in this debate, our opponents believe God has never had the ability to change what would happen. We will also show biblically how God obtains knowledge. And the Bible teaches that God obtains knowledge by observation and testing and searching and looking. This is a clear theme throughout the Bible. It never says God has always had all knowledge from eternity past. And it's worth mentioning that the characters in the Bible also did not think God possessed exhaustive knowledge of the future. For when God would tell them something would happen, they would respond by asking God how they would know this would come to pass. Or when God would say something would come to pass, they would attempt to get God to prevent it from happening. There is never a response to God in the Bible that the recipients think God's proclamation about what would come to pass was God revealing to them some parts of a settled future that was eternally fixed and therefore would undoubtedly come to pass. Here are just a handful of biblical examples out of the hundreds I had to choose from of God obtaining new information, God being surprised at what happened, God changing his mind, God showing regret over his own actions, and God stating he thought one thing would happen, but something else happened instead. In Genesis 2.19, it says God brought the animals to Adam in order to see what Adam would call them. Genesis 6, 6 says God regretted making mankind because they had become so wicked. This is why he destroyed everyone with the flood. In Genesis 18, 20, God says, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Notice the future tense here. I will go down to see if it's true. And if not, I will know. In Genesis 22, God tests Abraham to see if he will obey God, even to the point of sacrificing his only son, Isaac, through whom God promised Abraham descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. When Abraham raises the knife to slay his son in Genesis 22:12, God says, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. 
during the exodus from Egypt, God diverted the Israelites from traveling the most natural route, which was by the way of the land of the Philistines. Exodus 13, 17 says, Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. It wasn't known by God exactly what the Israelites would do if they saw war. After being in Egypt for so long, perhaps they would change their minds. The risk was not worth it to God, so he led them a different way. When Moses was on Mount Sinai with the Lord, the Israelites made a golden calf and worshipped it. So in Exodus 32.10, God says, Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation. But Moses asked God to turn from his fierce wrath and repent from the harm God said he would do. And Exodus 32.14 says, So the Lord repented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. God was not lying when he said he would destroy them. And the text clearly states he intended to destroy the Israelites, but Moses interceded and God changed his plan. God told Samuel in 1 Samuel 15 that he regretted setting up Saul as king. Verses 10 and 11 say this, Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And verse 35 says, And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death, Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Had God known the future and known what would happen by making Saul king, he would never say he regretted this action. He thought it would turn out one way, but it turned out much different than he had hoped. In Isaiah, it says God expected good grapes from Israel, but instead he got wild grapes. Isaiah 5.4 says, what more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? This is God speaking. He tells us that he expected one thing to happen, but it did not happen. This is not in any way reconcilable with the theory that God knows everything that will ever happen. In Jeremiah 18, God says that if nations repent, he will no longer do what he said he was going to do and will repent of what he himself thought he was going to do. Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8 says, The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will repent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. Notice God says he will not do that which he thought he would do. In Jeremiah 26, 3, God says, Perhaps everyone will listen and turn from his evil way, that I may repent concerning the calamity which I purpose to bring on them because of the evil of their doings. Notice two things. God purposes to bring calamity on them. He fully intends to do this. And then he speaks of the uncertainty of the future, specifically concerning what they will do. Perhaps they will turn from their evil way. Perhaps they will not. What they will do is not known to God or in any way settled. Next is the story of Jonah. This is a clear example where God changed his mind concerning what he said he would do. Jonah 3.10 says concerning Nineveh, Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God is not a liar. He does not say he will do something knowing with certainty that he will not do it. God intended to destroy Nineveh and changed his mind concerning what he said he would do. Again, the text says, God repented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Lastly, we have God's promise in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that we will never be tempted beyond what we can bear, but we have the ability to escape any temptation without sin. This would not be possible if the future was already settled, determined, known to God, with no possible chance of a different outcome. Awesome. Thank you guys for those openings. Uh, that was great. And now we're going to dive into the meat of the discussion here. Um, so like I mentioned, we're breaking this topic down into um, some segments. We're going to have three for each side that are going to be kind of subtopics that we're going to discuss. 
And um, we're going to start with the Arminians. They're going to be, uh, Dane and Dan, going to be questioning. Um, they're going to kind of lead it in an open discussion, but try to keep it under this subtopic if we can. Um, also, I, we've already talked, try not to like go too long. And then um, on the other side, when you guys are answering questions, try not to talk for, for uh, over like a minute or so at a time, um, if possible. Um, We'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to back out of here in just a second, and it'll just be you four guys on the screen. But the first subtopic, I'll just leave that up there. Um, it is prophecies in which God details specific future free decisions of humans. So that's kind of what they're going to uh, be talking about. Um, there's a specific example that they gave. It's 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 1 through 7. Um, that's where King Saul is anointed, and he was told a very specific series of events that were going to take place that day. Um, so I'm going to back out of here, and when I do, I'm going to go ahead and set the timer. And then uh, whichever of you has decided to uh, go ahead and lead it, uh, Dan or Dane, you guys can take it away, and then I'll jump in in 15 minutes, and we'll jump to the next topic. Let's see here. Well, Dane, you want to go, go on ahead. That's cool. Cool. Um, so for the uh, sake of our audience, let me read First Samuel 10, uh, verses 1 through 7. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on Saul's head, kissed him, and said, has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? When you leave me today, you will find two men at Rachel's tomb in Zelzah on the border of Benjamin. They will say to you, the donkeys you seek have been found. And now your father has stopped worrying about the donkeys and started worrying about you, asking, what should I do about my son? Then you will go on from there until you come to the Oak of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. They will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from their hands. After that, you will come to Gibeah of God, where the Philistines have an outpost. As you approach the city, you will meet a group of prophets saying, uh, a group of prophets coming down from the high place, proceeding by, preceded by harps, tambourines, flutes, and lyres, and they will be prophesying. Then the spirit of the Lord will rush upon you and you will prophesy with them and you will be transformed into a different person. When these signs have come, do as uh, the occasion demands for God is with you. So I wanted to read that in, in the entirety so that people knew what we were talking about. But you have lots of free actions being prophesied. You have sentences that people will speak. Um, so a, a person could choose a different word here or there out of their free uh, will. And so God is, is saying, these are the exact words they're going to say. Um, they, God even says exactly what they'll be holding. So uh, they're, they have the free will to eat one of those pieces of bread, but they're going to have exactly three in their hand, right? Uh, it's not going to be two. God's not going to get hungry and, uh, and eat half of a loaf or something. They're going to have three in their hand. And then they will freely decide to give two to salt, so on and so forth. I could talk about each one of these, um, but in there, there's many, many free choices. So how does God know that um, is going to happen in that exact precise way? Yeah, I'll start. So a couple things. Number one, um, there's an assumption I think being made here, which is that if God knows these events, then he knows everything exhaustively, which is not the case. Number two, um, there's an assumption here that God does not have the power, wisdom, and ability to make something come to pass unless he knows it ahead of time. That's the equivalent of saying you, you, you can't know what's going to happen in a movie unless you see the movie first. And third, there's a, a lot in this story that we don't have. And so, for example, it's, it's very possible we see this actually biblically where God talks to both parties. And so the best example we have of this is Acts 9 with the conversion of Saul, Paul. He talks to Paul and says what Ananias is going to do. He talks to Ananias and says what Paul is going to do and brings them together. So there's no reason to think in this particular situation that God didn't talk to both sides and tell them exactly what to do. So, so let me, can I follow up on that? So let's start with your comment about the assumption. So, you know, let's, let's say, for example, you know, I have, you know, different shirts in my closet. I have a red one and a green one and a blue one. And God says, you know, he knows that I have a red shirt and a green shirt. Um, 
But, you know, let's say, you know, he doesn't specifically say that God knows that he has a green shirt, but can't we just take it as an implication? Like, so if God knows this free action and that free action and that free action, why is the next one different? I, I, I apologize. I missed what you're trying to ask. So, okay. So like the, the Bible doesn't specifically say that God knows, you know, the, I don't know, the, the weight of a snail, right? Right. So, but, but he does, doesn't he? So yeah, that's I guess what I'm saying is if, if, it says, if the Bible says God knows everything and he, we have examples where it says that God knows this free action and that free action, why is the next free action unavailable for God to know? Sure. So number one, the Bible saying that God knows everything. Again, there's assumptions being made there. For example, I believe you guys are assuming that the future is a thing that exists to be known. And I would take huge issues with that. Uh, number two, uh, God tells us, and, and, I, and I'm sure we'll get to Isaiah 40 to 48. God tells us that when he says something is going to happen, it's because he's actively involved and uses his power and wisdom to make it come to pass. He never says, I'm telling you this because I know everything that's going to happen. Yeah, so so what's happening here is what's known as selection bias. You're grabbing a prophecy that does come true in detail, but there's other prophecies. Uh, so will, will the men of Kayla turn me over to Saul, King David asks, and God says, yes, it didn't happen. Why? Because uh, King David's like, okay, I'm not going to stick around then. And so he subverted it. And so then you, you do see times in the Bible where God wants something to happen and people use their free will to try to subvert God, and God really wants that thing to happen. And so sometimes a prophet will run away, and he'll swallow them with a the fish and kind of coerce them, physically coerce them into doing the things that he wants them to do. This is this is what we see. It's not this false, unfalsifiable uh, prophecy knowledge. These things can change based on what people in the, the story want to do. And the text doesn't treat it like, oh, this is a failed prophecy. It's the end of the world. So do you, do you agree that God at least knows some? free and responsible choices. Yes, I do. And people in the Bible do. Okay. And why? If, if God can know those, why can't he know others? Given the Bible says he knows everything. I, I still don't think I've gotten a clue. The Bible says that. man knows everything. <laughs> but you you don't believe that God, when they say God knows everything and, and man knows everything, that that means the same thing. I mean, again, it typ uh, typically the phrases in the Bible where it's talking about God's knowledge of everything on earth is typically a visual visual omniscience within the New Testament. When you see those phrases, the context is knowing the heart. And throughout the Bible, we, we know how God knows the heart. He tests the heart to know it. And so it's an acquired omniscience. It's acquired knowing everything. He tests to know. Well, John 1630 is contextually about Jesus prophesying the future. They're going to be um, persecuted. They're going to be uh, given the Holy Spirit so that they'll be able to uh, face these persecutions and be led into all truth. And that's when the disciples confess that Jesus knows all things. So, yeah, in 1 John 3.20, it's about knowing the heart, um, which is which is still profound omniscience. Right. Um, and one that all four of us would agree on. But the one in John 1630 is clearly about uh, knowledge of future events and knowledge of future free action. So this fits well in our subtopic here. Um, Jesus knows the knowledge of the free actions of um, uh, people who would arrest and beat and harm the disciples in the future. Right. But uh, again, we, we can't read into these phrases, things that aren't in the phrases. And so when the Bible says that mankind knows everything, and I read off the list of verses, we can't just assume that means all propositional knowledge, past, present, and future. Typically, all things just means a lot. King David knows all things on the earth. That just means he's got a lot of information. And uh, yeah, that is associated with the property of God. God does know things. God can predict. God does test. God does move nations. God can tell us what's happening in the future. Why? Because a lot of times God does those things. God knows people. God God calls nations to account. He moves them, as we through, see throughout the Bible, into position and manipulates history to get things done. God is capable. So, Chris, let me let me challenge you on your proof text in terms of um, people knowing all things. So, in First John two twenty. You you cited that one where um, there, but there's a textual variant that says. Um, you know, but you have an anointed from anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. So as a yeah, person, so that is that is in the critical text, but in the majority text, the Byzantine text, when they wrote that, you know all things, 
they, they don't, they, the people there didn't, didn't make like a mistake. They didn't look at that verse and say, oh, people have this type of omniscience that's ungenerated and unfalsifiable. It's just a general statement. And the, the, the funny thing is many people throughout history have just read that in the King James and the New King James, which is based on the majority text. And they read it like a normal person. But then they get to 1 John 3.20 and it says, God knows all things. And then that's out the window. And it's, oh, it must be my spe specific definition of omniscience. It's, it's uh, brother, uh, let me, let me, Let's throw this in here. When when the Bible tells us attributes of God and attributes of man, God's attributes are always higher than man's. So when it talks about God knowing all things, that is categorically different than when it talks about man knowing all things. For example, we would all agree here that God knows everything of the past when it talks about God knowing all things. Um, whereas no man could possibly know all things of the past. So I think I think you're um you're the one actually pulling things out of context because when something is in the context of being man-centered versus the context of being God-centered or man-descriptive versus God-descriptive, um, it's not apples to apples. God is higher than us. His ways and thoughts are higher than ours. So, yeah, so you do a... Oh, go ahead, Will. We're not saying that that this, the phrase all things when applied to God and the phrase all things when applied to man are identical. It's not what we're saying at all. We're just making the case that the word all generally doesn't mean all without exception. And... Dan, I didn't answer your question, which was, if God knows some free actions, why doesn't he know all of them? Again, there's an assumption being made there, Dan, which is 1 Samuel 10, the example you brought up, is talking about people who exist, and it's talking about what they'll do that day. So that's very easy for God to know and understand and predict. Where it would become different is if God was saying what people would do who don't exist yet. Okay, well, let's go there. So, Dan, do you want to bring up maybe some of the Daniel uh, stuff or Cyrus stuff? Um, yeah. You know, God does okay. predict things hundreds of years in advance. Yeah, so, okay. So, Daniel eleven thirty six, 36, uh, it says, And the king shall do as he wills. So, this is a free will action on the part of uh, Antiochus, right? He shall, be, he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished. And then this is the last phrase, but this is important. For what is decreed shall be done. So it's a free will action of the king, you know, hundred, you know hundreds of years in advance. And, you know, God, what is decreed shall be done. So it's that's yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, let's let's just pretend, for sake of argument, everything you said is true, accurate, and uh, without dispute. Even if that's the case, that doesn't mean that God knows exhaustively all things in the future. Again, you're just showing one instance of God knowing. Yes, it is a complicated thing. It is stretched out, but it doesn't it doesn't address some of the things that we've talked about tonight. How does God? gain his knowledge of the future. Uh, we, we showed that God tests to know, God watches to know, God does to know. So maybe this is a case of God doing something, bringing about, using his power to accomplish. It could be the case that that is how God knows this. But think okay. about all the free will. I mean, it's, it's not just God's freedom <clears throat> at play here. Think about all the different human interactions that would have to take place to lead up to this. I mean, uh, Think of all the couples that would have to get together and have the uh, exact right genetic child for this individual uh, to come generations later. I mean, um, uh, yeah, I think God could do that. So I, th I think God could raise new children of Abraham from the rocks and uh, subvert what people think, how God thinks he must accomplish his prophecies. John the Baptist says God is smarter than us. He could raise new children of Abraham from the rocks and get his plans done. So let's so Chris, the, I think that the text you brought up was Hebrews four thirteen, right? And so uh, just backing up to verse twelve, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit and joint of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, right? And then yeah. you went on to thirteen. There is no creature hidden from his sight but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who must we give account. Do you see thoughts? Do I see thoughts? Uh, I, I could. Uh, the C has a lot of different meanings to it. So it depends how the word's being used. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the king of Tyre in the Bible, no secret can be hidden from him. Okay. But in, in general, I would say that we don't physically see thoughts. Now, 
Do you also think that God has eyes? Uh, well, I think we're all Trinitarians here. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. So okay. do you guys believe God has eyes? I think we're Trinitarian, so I think we'd all say yes. Well, the second person of the Trinity took on a body and has eyes. Okay, but, so God has eyes, yeah. But God the Father... No, wait, wait, no. God the Father is, is invisible spirit. I, I'm sorry. So you're saying that the divine nature has eyes? I'm saying the divine... Uh, I'm saying Trinitarians who think Jesus is God should should say that God has eyes, right? What about before the incarnation, brother? Because uh, the eyes of God is used in the Old Testament. Yeah, he, he goes and eats with uh, Moses. Uh, he goes and eats with Abraham. Um, there, there's a scene where in Exodus 33 where God covers uh, Moses with his hand and pass by and allow, allows him to see his backside. So wait, God, I'm not trying to interrupt you, but our subtopic time is dwindling. You believe that um, God has always had a body from eternity past? God's had multiple bodies. God could do what he wants. He's got a Shekinah glory that can inhabit the temple. God's God. Okay. So in, in Luke 24, 23, Christ says that a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Yeah. Yes. So, right. So, I mean, the you know, God is a spirit. He doesn't have, um, he doesn't have eyes. He doesn't have eyes. So the, the the divine nature doesn't have eyes. Okay, if I, for for the sake I mean, for the sake of the debate, we'll ju we'll just grant the point, and so you can make the point about Hebrews. Okay. Anyways, uh, our time is up. Uh, well, you can make your point real quick. I'd like to hear it. It's 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 simply that in the in the hypostatic union, it, Christ has both a human and divine nature. No, no, your point about Hebrews about watching. It, it is is it simply that we don't it's it's obviously figurative language because we don't see thoughts all right we're going to go ahead and jump to the next question uh the next subtopic and uh i'm glad you guys just kept going without a hitch because my laptop just totally froze <laughs> and then like i had to completely restart it so <laughs> um it's cool that you're able to keep going so if, if something happens and like i don't show up whenever i'm supposed to then just keep going <laughs> Um, so hopefully that won't happen again. Um, but I also lost the timer whenever I, I go to another, it, screen, it just the, expired. The timer so you could re restart it. It was right on time, man. I mean, that's, yeah. uh, that's pretty providential right there. Yes. All right. <laughs> okay. So, uh, now we're jumping to the first, uh, question put forward by the open theist and I'm going to put it at the bottom of the screen here. It is, what does the Bible tell us as to how God gains information? Here we go. I'm going to back up. You guys take it away, and I'll start your timer. So, Dan and Dane, uh, what do you see specifically? Which Bible verses do you see that tell us how God obtains knowledge concerning human actions? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, I'm, you know, obviously I wouldn't phrase it the same way that you and Chris would. Uh, I wouldn't speak of it as obtaining knowledge. I believe that God's knowledge is uh, eternal. Um, God doesn't learn like a man would learn. Uh, God simply knows everything as one of his divine characteristics. So uh, the idea of God obtaining knowledge is is not how I'd phrase it. And, and obviously you all have some great uh, proof texts around um, it, it, it appears in scripture through what I would consider metaphorical or anthropomorphic language, uh, God gaining knowledge. But let, let me take an example. So Abraham in Genesis 22, 12, you know, it says that, um, uh, God tells him to stay his hand because now he knows that, um, he fears God, but God already knew that he feared God, right? Like Genesis 15, six, uh, God credited to Abraham, uh, righteousness because of his faith. So, um, God had, had, uh, been, Abraham had walked with God as one walks with a friend. God already knew that. So it's, it's, in my opinion, it's like a, it's kind of like the Hebrew idiom where you pile things on poetically. Like now I know that you fear me. I already knew he already knew that he feared him though. It's not that God learned something new about Abraham. And even in the open theist position, God would know his, his heart in the present moment before that too. So, um, he would have already known it even in your position. I so think. real quick, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing an answer. What does the Bible say as to how God knows what humans do? 
The Bible teaches us that God has infinite knowledge. Uh, okay, infinite I got to stop you right there. I'm sorry. That's a misquote of the verse. It does not say that God has infinite knowledge. It says he has infinite understanding. Mm -hmm. Understanding is different than knowledge. Understanding means there's no problem God can't solve. There's no math equation that he doesn't know the answer to. He could think and thinking is open theism. So that verse actually proves our point. Is it safe to say that you don't can't think of a verse that says how God knows what men do? So no, I can think of many verses where it says God is not counseled by any man. That doesn't tell us how God knows what men do. So again, I, I would push back on this idea that um, un, obviously understanding is a little bit more than knowledge, but it includes knowledge. It has to, because yeah. otherwise it's not understanding. Right. Your understanding includes knowledge, but that's not what the verse says. So real quick, Dan, do you can you think of a verse that tells us how God knows what men do? So again, again, so uh, understanding includes knowledge. So if his understanding is infinite, so is his knowledge. That, so from for, because his understanding is infinite, you know, then there's not going to be like a temporal gap or something like that. Um, now we we recognize that there's, you know, kind of this logical priority in terms of, well, the thing that God knows uh, logically precedes and explains the fact that God knows it. But what we deny is it's it's causative in the sense of like, let's say, for example, me, you know, my eye. So if I'm holding up a cell phone here, right, there's physical properties like bouncing off the cell phone and going into my eyes and then creating a mental image of my brain. There's no such thing with God because God doesn't have physical eyes, which we were talking about before. So there's not a causative relationship, but we don't we don't deny or I, I'm not denying that there's a logical. Um, OK, great. Let me jump in here because I'm not hearing any Bible verses. I'll, I'll, I'll give us one because I believe the Bible tells us that God looks and watches in order to obtain information on what men do. Genesis 18 says, God says, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, future tense, I will know. What does that mean? Well, Will, do you deny omnipresence? That's not related to what we're talking about. It absolutely is related. You're, you're saying that God couldn't know unless he went down and saw it. I'm reading a Bible verse. I'm not saying what I believe. And I want to know what you think that verse means. It's uh, it's anthropomorphic language. God doesn't have to walk down to Sodom like a man to see what they're doing in that city. God is in all, through all, and above all things, uh, Ephesians 4, 6. Um, there's not a place we could hide from his spirit in Psalm 139. And I'm not trying to deviate from the topic. I'm trying to say that your interpretation doesn't just damage omniscience. It damages omnipresence. Okay, right. but that, does, that, that doesn't answer the question. Why is God saying, and if not, I will know let, if let me, he already knows? Let, let, me, let, me try, let me take a shot. So um, the, the passage is the opposite, right? Like, if not, then I will know. Okay, so for starters, this is about Sodom and Gomorrah. So for one thing, this is not just denying future knowledge, it's denying past knowledge, right? Because these things had already happened, Yep. right? And then for another thing, it's the opposite opposite it's it's kind of this uh counterfactual if they don't if they haven't done these things then god would know those things right so if, if if they haven't rebelled if they haven't fallen into the horrible sins then god will know that they haven't fall, fallen into those horrible sins that goes along exactly with what we're what we've been saying there is a, a, a logical dependence if we did something different then god would have known that Sure. No problem there. It says, I will go down now and see whether they have done according to what thou cry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Okay. So, so yeah, let's drill into that. The so outcry what does it has mean? come up to God. If these events have already happened and people are praying to God about it. And yet God, are you saying that God doesn't know the past? No, we're yeah. saying he doesn't know the future. He's talking about the future. He's going to go down no, and if not, no, Dan, I will know. Dan's point is very uh, solid here. There's, God is saying, if these things have occurred, I'll go and find out. So in your interpretation, for God having to learn this in the future, he wouldn't have known already the sins of the past of Sodom. Yeah, but that's, that's which, which would topic. mean... This is not about what I think verse means. It's not about my problems. I want to know what you guys think the words actually mean. That's it. What, do you, what does I, it mean? I think God is a very personal God, and he relates to us um, through Scripture in a very personal way. Uh, and so, uh oh, uh, we, so to yeah. stay, answer your question, I think the, the what this passage is saying is um, that if they hadn't c 
committed the horrible sins that people are praying to God about. If they hadn't, then God would know that. That's what it's saying. And I think that's literally what it's saying. If not, I will know. Yeah, right? yeah it's, it's saying that I'm going to go down to see if they've done what, they, what I've heard they've done. And if they haven't, I will know future tense. God, out of God's God mouth. The past. That's the past. Not well, the if, if God doesn't know the past, open theism is true. And uh, do you do you deny that God knows the past? I, we can't. It's we off can't. topic. <laughs> it's off well, topic. something's happened here. It's the first. You asked me about the first. For the sake okay, of the debate, whatever. we'll we'll say yes for me. To, oh, I'm sorry. I oh, said wow. for the sake of the debate, you could say yes for me. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, if God doesn't know the past, then something that, that's beyond that's beyond open theism. Like, right? Like that's that is open theism because God learns, mm -hmm. and if God learns, open theism is true. I, I, well, I guess what I would say is, I, I, at least I don't hear things like that from um, Boyd, Rice, Sanders, those guys. Yeah, but tonight we're talking about the Bible, so we're 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 seeing what the Bible says. So okay. if this verse actually says that God doesn't know the past. We have to deal with it. It has to mean something. It can't mean nothing. So I've already explained what I think it means, that essentially exactly what it says. If not, I will know, right? So if they had not done those things, God would know that. Okay, so we're, we're getting the cue to move on. So I will be asking the next question. So Psalms 53, 2 says, God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there's any who understand who seek God. So what's the reason God's watching man in this verse? Okay. So for starters, it is, it is, um, you know, God doesn't have physical eyes. And we may just have to agree to disagree on that point. Eyes but, are not mentioned in this verse. So so in terms of the sight, there, there's an anthropomorphic aspect. But it is as if God has perception and but it's not a causative relationship. It's a it's a logical relationship. So, um, but there's the fact, a reason, like right, uh, God watches to see if there's any who understand. So, what's the reason God's watching? Is God's watching? Yeah, God's watching to see if anyone understands. Um, God can uh, do things in time. I mean, the incarnation. So, is is time. he gaining from outside himself? Is is knowledge flowing to God from outside himself in this verse? Well, I think that uh, God acts both imminently and transcendently. God acts personally in scripture. Is he um, gaining knowledge from outside himself though? Well, no, God has all knowledge. That's my position. But God God doesn't actually cover us with uh, feathers of his wing, but I take um, great comfort knowing that God is there for me and protects me and loves me. But I don't actually think that verse teaches that he has wings like a bird. So what do you think this verse teaches? That God watches the world, that we will uh, render an account to Him. What does it mean? To nothing is hidden from His sight. So, the, does He is He gaining? He to, why does He need to watch the world if He's all, already known everything from eternity past? He's a personal God. Um, he uh, He loves us. He's He interacts with us. The incarnation proves that in the most dramatic and beautiful way. And so the it, verse could simply <laughs> say that God looks down because He's a personal being. But what does Psalm fifty three two say as to why God looks down? He looks down to see if there are faithful uh, people. Bingo. And if, and we should take from that that all our actions are going to be, um, we're held accountable to all our actions. Does, God is a, is a judge. Does God ever look and not find what he's looking for? Um, does uh, God ever look for something and then not find what he's looking for? Well, certainly he wants faith and prayerfulness and doesn't always find that. Yeah, it, Ezekiel 22, uh, 30 says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Yeah. So God mm -hmm. looks for something sometimes and doesn't find it, right? Right. I mean, he's teaching us uh, about our depravity. He's teaching us about our sinfulness, our wickedness. He's reminding us that he sees all our depravity and that we're going to be held accountable for it. But he's it's, seeking, um, right? He's but, but but back back up to that. So let's let's say he's seeking. Let's say that he expects to see something and doesn't see it. Then then we've got the conclusion that God was wrong. That God held a false belief, and that's obviously incorrect. No, Jeremiah three seven says, "I expected Israel to return to me, but she did not." 
Uh, okay, so Jeremiah three seven. Oh, yeah, uh, this is this is typical language that God expected good grapes and uh, received wild grapes. Okay, so let's. Okay, I, okay, I'm glad you brought that up. So this is that's uh, Isaiah five three and four, right? Yeah, and then my first one is Jeremiah three seven. Okay, well, um, we can look in that one too. But so let's go to the Isaiah passage. Is that okay? Uh, uh, Will is that okay? Yeah, definitely. God speaks and he says, I expected one thing, but I did not get it. So what does that mean? Okay. So good, good question. Good question. Okay. So the, the preceding verse says, judge between me and my vineyard, right? So it's a, it's a, basically he's inviting humans to check him out to see if God is being fair. All right. So, so far so good. Well, we're going to run out of time. I want to know what okay. it means that God expected good grapes, but received okay. wild grapes. F fair enough. So, okay. So the, the it, it is a trial speech. It's like a lawyer basically adding, asking a rhetorical question to get, to get a conviction, right? So this question for starters would be about the past because, you know, the grapes has already happened, right? You know, the, the bad grapes have already come. The, the so story is set in the past. So it's, so it's, it's, it's a, future failed expectations, right? right? Right, so it's it's a rhetorical question. Now, the the um, you know the the word for expects can actually be translated longs for or desires or that sort of thing, um, but it's it's a rhetorical question in the scene of a trial, and in essence, he's getting the jury, the audience, us to ask ourselves that question to realize that Israel is at, is at fault in this case. But on the flip side, what we've already seen in Deuteronomy 30, 16, God has already said that he knows that Jerusalem, will, you know, the Israelites will go play the harlot with strange gods in the land in the midst of them where they're going, they'll forsake him and break his covenant. So God already knows this. So it's not something that's surprising to him. But on okay, the flip side, let's in, say- in, in Isaiah five, God actually asks himself, he says, what more could I have done to get Israel to respond to me. Right. And he also says in Isaiah 5 that he built a wine press. Why do you build a wine press? So if they had obeyed, they would the blessings would have flowed and God would have used them in, in, in wonderful ways. And that's what the wine press represents. You only right. build a wine press if you think you're going to have good grapes. So God actually says he built a wine press. He expected good grapes, but he got wild grapes and never even could use the wine press. Yeah, well, so Will, you you admitted that God's understanding is infinite, and you said that that means he he understands how to do whatever he wants to do. Yep. So um, when it clearly has to be metaphorical, anthropomorphic, figurative, when God says, "What more could I have done?" His understanding is perfect. He knows what he could have or could have refrained from doing. That's wrong. That's wrong. Okay, what we're forgetting about here is the will, and the will is something that not even God can uh, take over. Like the lawyers cannot, rejected the will well, of God. He, take over will. he hardens the uh, king of Sihon's heart. He hardens mm -hmm. Pharaoh's heart. He makes Nebuchadnezzar to be a brute beast. He can clearly take over people's wills. You, you are, uh, you're confusing and conflating will and ability. Okay. So God cannot make someone love him. Love must be freely given. Well, that's, that's a little different than saying he never overrides. No, 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 no. That's exactly what Isaiah 5 is about. God did everything he could to get Israel to love him, and they did not love him, and he thought they would. So I, I think there's an element of truth, because when he says, what more could I have done? They, they were swimming in grace and revelation and light and truth. There's no question about that. And they should have produced good grapes, and they did not do so. But the question is, you know, is this new information that God's taking in? If it is, then God was wrong. God yeah. believed that, that that they are going to produce good grapes, and he was in error. Yeah, in my opening yeah. statement, if God knows something about the future that turns out to be false, open theism is true. Well, well, yeah, but, but what do you think about true. Dan reminding us that in Deuteronomy, God prophesied that Israel would go after strange gods? Um, that's that's not like an indefinite thing. That's always true, no matter what circumstances, forevermore. That's yeah, that that did happen. It happened in Deuteronomy. It happened in it happened Exodus. On multiple occasions. Yes, and, and, and so, so it happened. So why would God be surprised if it happens again? I I, I think be, that you're because he God he set up the circumstances his, to, uh, to to try to subvert it. God had the cycle of apostasy in which he he attempted all sorts of different ways to reach Israel, and he kept trying different things, seeing if that's going to work. And he got frustrated with them. And uh, he, he at one point said, "I'm not going to even uh, listen to your prayers anymore. Uh, when you guys repent, you're just going to turn back to be evil again." And guess what happens? 
Uh, as soon as he abandons them, they pray out again, and he changes his mind on the second. He said, I, I'm not going to listen to you guys anymore. They cry out. He's like, fine, I'll save you again. Hmm. All right, good stuff, guys. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump to the next one. Um, I'll give you a little bit of leeway uh, as I'm enjoying the conversation. It is meant to be kind of more free-flowing, uh, but we do have other um, subtopics to jump into, so we're going to do that right now. Um, the next one to be led by the Arminians is... Um, Okay, foreknowledge of free human actions is a defining attribute of deity. And they gave this example, John 13, 19. Um, it says, I am telling you this now before it takes place that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. So same as before, I'm going to back out and start. First, would we all agree that when Jesus says uh, that you will know I am he, that's a claim to knowing that he is deity, right? Or I, affiliated with deity. Go ahead, Will. I, I actually interpret that passage as uh, meaning he's the Messiah. Yes, that's is what I is see the, as well. Is the Messiah fully God? Uh, sure. the, Cyrus was a Messiah. Messiah is a pretty common word within the Bible. There's many Christs. Jesus was just the one prophesied for that certain time period. Well, let's say the, uh, the Christ of Christs and the Messiah of Messiahs, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, that is, that is God. All right. So Jesus wasn't omniscient uh, in Mark 13, 32. He didn't know the end date. And so it's not a claim for omniscience. There is there is a, a strong a sense of association with deity for knowing things about the present and knowing things about the future and being affiliated with things that are going to come to pass. Yes. And, and you would see uh, the relationship between what Jesus is doing in the upper room with um, Isaiah chapters 40 through 48. Um, I certainly see the relationship there. So in Isaiah 40 through 48, the cir circumstance there is there's a trial of the false gods. Right. It, it, Israel doesn't worship gods. And so they're put up as the judge and God's trying to convince them to worship him. And he does so by saying, I can do the things that I say I'm going to do. These false gods, they only tell you after the fact, uh, they, they claim credit for the things that are done. I say I'm going to do something and then I do it. And in that fashion, you know, it's me who does it. And so Isaiah 40 through 48 is, is a power claim. It's not a knowledge claim. It's not like I got propositional knowledge about the future. It's practicality. God can do things. Well, it's certainly, I mean, I, I see in, in, in some of the statements y'all have made, you, you sort of um, dissect attributes of God. I mean, part of his omnipotence is his omniscience and part of his omniscience is his omnipotence. I mean, separating those is strange. And an example comes out of the uh, Isaiah 40 through 48 chapters. And I don't have the exact verse in front of me, but God knows how many stars he's going to make before he makes them. He knows them by name. He calls them into existence. So you you have to realize his power is expressed in making all these stars. The, the very he, next verse is him counting the waters. I, I'm sorry. You, but you don't actually believe that God, see, God I, counts. I feel like yes, take I, very I, literally things that are clearly uh, metaphorical. Yeah, when the Bible says that God knows the number of hair on your head, God counts our hair. That that's open theism. Will, so, or did you have to say so something? Explain explain that to me. Does God does God come to your the top of your head and start you know counting? No, like uh, when I'm out with my seven children, I kind of look around. And it's just like okay, that's that's seven. And God's smarter than me. Will, <laughs> hey Dane, I actually uh, don't agree with what you're saying with the whole subtopic. I do not believe that foreknowledge of human free actions is a defining attribute of deity. And I don't think you can establish that biblically. Well, uh, let's, let's focus in just real, uh, on Isaiah 41, uh, 21 through 23. So God literally mocks the false idols because they cannot tell them anything about the future. No, this it's is, because they this can't. Is God's, this is God's premier way of, showing himself as different above and more exalted than the false gods. His, his chief way of doing this is saying, I know the future and they don't. No, that's, that, that's I mean by the subtopic. That's not, that's not okay. what's happening there though. Uh, Isaiah, we'll for, Isaiah 41 does not say it's the chief way. And I think, unfortunately you may have to re uh, rethink this argument, Dane, because everybody leaves out verse 23. <clears throat> so I I'll just read it really quick. Statement. 
present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things, what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them or declare to us things to come. Here's the key verse now. Show the things that are to come hereafter that we may know that you are God's. Yes, do good or do evil that we may be dismayed and see it together. So if you're going to be logically consistent and say Isaiah 41, 21 to 3 are the defining attributes of deity, then they are uh, saying what will happen in the future, saying what happens in the past, doing good and doing evil. And I don't think you're going to be, be able to be consistent and say that doing evil is a defining attribute of deity. Well, well, not not sinful evil. Um, I think that there's I, I don't have the exact verse off the top of my head, but it's in Isaiah. You know, I create darkness and light, um, good and evil. And I mean, it's not sinful evil. God would never sin. Yeah, so, that's, that's how but, but like he brings pestilence and sword upon nations and things of that. Like, right. Yes, but, but these are not defining attributes of deity. Not only does Isaiah 41 not say these are defining attributes of deity, to be consistent, that's just not our list. Well, certainly to bless or judge is defining attribute of deity. God's the only one that has that right to bless or to judge a, a nation. Yeah. So in, in context, though, God is trying to convince people that he is God, and he does it through recounting past acts he's done, past predictions he said that he's going to do, and then the fulfillment of those predictions. And then within the context, he declares new things, brand new things that he came up with, uh, I, I went through this whole thing. There's a, a whole debate online. Does Isaiah 40 through 48 teach open theism where I go through each verse uh, in each chapter and show the open theistic elements? God responds. God thinks. God has discursive knowledge. God considers things and then does things. Th th this is processing. So Isaiah 40 through 48 is a strong open theistic proof text. Well, it's it's not, though, because um, let's let's read this again. So. Let them come and tell us what will happen. So God is mocking them because they cannot do that, right? right. The false gods cannot tell them what's going to happen. Yeah. Tell the former things so that we may reflect on them and know the outcome or announce to us what is coming. Again, tell me what happened in the past and make sense of it. Not just tell me the event, any historic basic that, but explain to me why it happened that way. And then it says, or you could tell us something about the future. Tell us the things that are to come so that we may know you are gods. We cannot know they are gods unless they tell us the, the future. That's why I'm saying it's a defining attribute. No, it, it's, it's, it's a power claim again. So it's proof that the, the idols have power is if they've said something in the past and then brought it about. You can't ex post facto claim that you did a power act without having first declared it before that power act happened. happened. Is knowing the future That's powerful? Uh, that's it's not about propositional knowledge about the future. It's about God's doing what God says He's going to do, how which do open theists agree. How with. do you um how do you dissect this from propositional statements of the future? God is saying make because God a has plans statement of the future. And then as we read elsewhere, sometimes God changes His plans based on circumstances. So this is not fatalistic knowledge of the future. This is just normal prophecy how God operates, and and the world doesn't come to the uh, to the end when God doesn't destroy Nineveh. Because a prophecy failed, God looks at circumstances Chris? and can change accordingly. Yeah, Dan, jump in. Oh uh, no, I thought we lost uh, Chris's audio, but I, actually, um, we—I mean, we can look at. Well, uh, hold on, real quick. So again, we can't say this is a defining attribute of deity if a the text doesn't say it, and b the text says that it's asking these false gods to do good or evil. We yeah, but do you understand we, that evil we, doesn't mean necessarily. I'm not. Evil. I'm not, major, I'm not a majoring on bring a sword. I'm not majoring like on evil. We can do good as well. The, the reality is, what God is talking about is that they're stone idols. They can't do anything. We actually can't do good without the Holy Spirit. Okay, but that's a different topic. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I, think, yeah. I think for most people, defining attributes of deity would be that God is loving. Would be that God is merciful. Not picking. Knowing future actions, knowing past actions, doing good and evil, which is what this passage states. Well, the, this is God himself putting the false gods on trial. We all yeah. agree with that. And God didn't say, prove to me that you're a God by how loving you are. He said, prove to me you're a God by um, what you know about the future. So this is God's right, because, choice in how he will prosecute the false gods. Yeah, because who's, who's the judge? God is the judge. No, not in the text. In the text, Israel's the judge. 
the Israel's judging between him and the idols, and he has to give practical arguments why Israel should worship him instead of the false gods. And so he, he starts them on a whirlwind tour saying, I created the world. I led you guys out of captivity. I did all these things in the past. Uh, worship me. I've told you things I'm going to do, and then I've done them. And so you see that I'm a powerful God. It's not like a trivia contest. It's not like well, Alex Trebek. It's like, I'll take a uh, category well, want, for 500. I want Dan to jump in, but I just want to say one more thing that um, uh, I, I actually think God is the judge. He is clearly judging these false gods and showing them as, as absolutely foolish. But Dan, I want you to get some questions in because it's been all me on this subtopic. Well, no, no, on the, along the same line. So just taking um, Isaiah, uh, I guess this is 43, 9. Um, the last part, who can verify that they spoke the truth, right? Who can verify that they spoke the truth? Now, I guess the, uh, I think this is probably maybe a question directed for you specifically, Chris. So you, you talk about knowledge that can be wrong. People can have knowledge of the future that can be wrong, but th that's not knowledge because knowledge, let's, let's say knowledge is justified to believe. Right. But if it's false, if they're saying the wrong thing, then that's not even knowledge. Uh, God said that he knew that the men of Kayla would turn David over to Saul. That didn't that didn't happen. OK, I'm sorry, but just do you agree that knowledge is justified true belief? Uh, that's a practical definition, but it's not typically what we mean by knowledge. What, what do you, what do we mean by knowledge? God's knowledge is dynamic in our view, not static like your view. So that's very that's a very so, crucial <laughs> distinction here. So I know I'm wearing socks right now, right? Is that a you know? Does God know the future in the sense that I know that I'm wearing socks right now? Well, the well, fact you're wearing socks right now is present, not future. And it's immediated knowledge as well through your senses. Okay, right, but but the fact that. So I'm sorry. So if, if God knows that you... What's the difference between my knowledge of me wearing socks and, and the knowledge of the future? If you're making a distinction, I think I'm hearing you. Well, you if, if both are mediated knowledge, yeah, God does have that type of mediated knowledge, as we've shown throughout the Bible. God tests to know. God searches to predict. God so, does, and that's how he's familiar with future events. So in that sense, then how can God know something and it be false? If knowledge is justified true belief, how can God know something that's false? Because when when uh, Abraham says, I know that if I bring Sarah to Egypt, they're going to kill me and uh, because you're a beautiful woman, we don't say, oh, he he's wrong. He didn't actually know that. That's not our definition of knowledge. Our definition of knowledge is, yeah, that's that would happen in those circumstances, but he chose to not do those circumstances. And so it's not like his knowledge failed. It's it's not like uh, his his knowledge is now canceled and he didn't have knowledge of that thing. He, he just generally had knowledge based on his knowledge of human nature. Okay. So in in with Abraham, you know, obviously Abraham says that he knew his wife was beautiful, right? And so that's obviously true. And then, you know, I guess it would be kind of hypothetical, you know, if I don't lie to them, they're going to kill me, right? So that's why I'm going to lie to them. Yeah, in the same sense, the men of Kayla turning David over to Saul. Uh, yeah, David has to stick around for that. God has to not intervene and just suck all Saul's men down to hell, things like that. It's just a general knowledge of the future based on how you know how people act. At, at the end of the day, though, are you saying that God knows things that are false? We've not said that. I thought I heard it from Chris. But it, or Chris, do you think God knows things that are false? God thinks things that do not materialize, yes. And, and that's throughout the Bible. In circumstances, that's a that's difference. Throughout the Bible, yeah, I, so I expected the, them to return to me. They did not. Okay, so so then, I mean, so I guess uh, God, does God know things that are false that don't turn out to be true? Yeah, in the same way that Abraham does, and you and I, in, in our day to day life, I, I know so that God's if, understanding is, is just so like I, a man's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, I, that's I not what I said. God has just like Abraham's. Yeah, in you're the, the one that said just like Abraham's. Yeah, in the yeah, same but even... sense, but it's it's uh, on the scale way different. God has a lot more knowledge and power than me within the Bible. Again, this is what the Bible teaches. This is our our entire discussion is what does the Bible teach? And so, so we see God in the Bible knowing things about the future that don't materialize. So I, again, again, okay. So even taking a human standpoint, no one says you know well. Okay, I think it's gonna 
um, let's say yesterday I said, I think it's going to rain today. And then it doesn't rain. We wouldn't say yesterday I knew it was going to rain after we saw that it didn't materialize, right? So, you know, Abraham's knowledge claim there, the fact that his wife was beautiful is just a straight up knowledge claim. That's fine. But the fact of, you know, that he's saying that if I don't lie to them, then they're going to kill me. That's hypothetical. It's not. Um, I don't understand the point you're making by saying that that Abraham said that. Oh, um, I, I brought it up. And so yeah. my, my point was to illustrate how knowledge is actually used in the Bible and it's not used in this fatalistic, unfalsifiable way. It's just our normal definition of how you and I would use knowledge. Like my knowledge of my socks. I think God knows the future. Like I know I'm wearing my socks. Well, then open theism is true because you have immediate knowledge. If God knows the future the same way you know that you have socks, open <laughs> theism is true. Oh, okay. So there's a difference between discursive yeah. knowledge and, and sensory, yeah. and sensory you, knowledge. You, if God gains knowledge, propositional information from sensory inf in, in input, then open theism is true. If it's causative, right? But it, so if God has never God's said God's that. knowledge is like perception in some ways, it's like perception, obviously, because the Bible says that it's not like a human's perception because it's not causative, it's not through physical eyes. So but, if if God's knowledge depends on things outside himself, then those things take precedence over God's knowledge, and God doesn't have exhaustive knowledge of the future. It's a gained omniscience. Okay. Uh, time's up, but all right, we're, we're uh, halfway through, jumping into uh, the next open theism-led question. Let's see. Okay, according to the Bible, has God ever had the ability to change what would happen? Um, I'll let the audience know I am going to be uh, taking up some questions, and we're going to have about 30 minutes of audience Q&A after this. Um, not after this one, but after the, the end of the debate, after we wrap things up. So um, typically you could tag me. I'm not seeing the tags because I'm using StreamYard right now. And so I would ask you to just like type your question in all caps, uh, like you're yelling, and then I will take down your questions. And uh, that'll be a, a way for it to kind of stand out from the rest of the group. So you can ask your questions whenever. If they do get answered in the next couple sessions, then I probably won't ask them again. Um, but you can go ahead and start asking now if you'd like. And I'm going to back out of here and start the timer. Great. Dan and Dane, you both believe God has exhaustive foreknowledge, meaning God knows what will happen before it happens. Do you believe the Bible disagrees with that position? and teaches that God has the ability to change what would happen, thereby making the future open and not settled. Um, I think I reject the premise behind the question. So of course, God has the ability to do things differently, but- Differently than what? Than what will happen. Than what he knows will happen? Okay, so can and will are different concepts, right? Can is about ability and possibility and will is about future yeah i didn't use the word can ability you use the word ability right the question is uh, does god ever have the ability to change what would happen correct or, or what will happen the, i think the answer is yes god can do diff god can do things differently than what the way they will happen and and here's how i would phrase it um god has the ability to do whatever god wants to do he's a he's the most free being um but God is working out all things according to the counsel of his will and for his good pleasure, uh, Ephesians 1.11. He's a God that is all wise. Um, and so the plan that he has made and the covenant that he has made with uh, between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit um, uh, is, is perfect. And so there would be no need to change what he knows he's going to do. That's, yeah, unfortunately, that's different than what I'm asking. I'm not asking if he's done this or will do this. I'm just saying, can God change what he knows will happen? Yes or no? I, I just don't uh, think the question is worded um, in a way that that is fair for our position. Our position would say he has the ability to do whatever he wants, and he knows what he wants to do. Okay, so if he has the ability to do whatever he wants, if he wants to change what he knows will happen, can he? Yes. Well, because he's all wise, 
he's not going to change anything. But yes, he has the power to do whatever he wants. Okay, great. So you guys, open theism, you just admitted open theism is true. If God no. can change what he knows will happen, then open theism is true. So That's not will, necessarily true. Yeah, will. There's a difference between the word can and the word will. I didn't use the word can. But the, there's a difference between the ability and future. The difference between can and will. Those are different I, concepts. So like, if God will do something different than he will do, that's a contradiction, right? I, yeah. But he can do something different than he will do. He has the ability to do something different than he will do. Here's the, here's the classic text. Right. This is uh, Matthew 26. Actually, sorry, um, before, before we get into that, I want to simplify this for you in the audience. If God knows X will happen, can God make Y happen instead? Yes. Okay. Open theism is true. You, you no, just know, but, but he can he he can do something and no, he's not going to. I so let me give you a, a very human example. I have the ability to quit my job tomorrow, but I'm no, I'm not going to do that. It's not that I can't. It's that I know that I won't because I'm wise enough to know I need to put food on the table and I enjoy my job. Correct. But your admission that God can make Y happen if he knows X will happen, is it admission that the future is open and not settled? The it's future an admission of God's all powerful um, and, uh, and free ability. But in his wisdom and knowledge, he knows exactly what he is going to do, wants to do. And, and like Ephesians 1.11 says, he works out all things according to his counsel and good pleasure and his will. Correct. But if, but if God would act on what you're saying he can do, which is make Y happen when he knows X will happen, then that means his foreknowledge was not accurate. No. No. no if, his if, foreknowledge if it actually accurate. turns out differently, if, it, if the fact actually turns out differently, then his foreknowledge was wrong. But the fact that he can do something different does not. I just, Dan, I wrong. just said if he acts on the desire, the ability, and he actually makes Y happen when he foreknew X would happen, that then open that would be open to this. Yeah, that would be that never happens. But that's yeah. not, we're, we're saying okay. that doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay, you're saying it doesn't happen, but just the fact that God has the ability to means we're right. That means the future is open and not settled. That's so, not true. Um, so, again, ability does not mean necessity. Like so, you have so many abilities that you don't act on every single day because you're wise enough not to act on them. Right. So, like you don't okay. go punching puppies, I assume. So, okay. so if, you, if you do, that'd be bad. Let's, let's go to Matthew 26, Dan, you brought this up. Jesus was betrayed and, and Peter tries to fight off those arresting Jesus. And so in verse 53, Jesus says, do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Here's my question for both of you. How can this be true if this was not part of God's foreknowledge? Meaning, if God had foreknowledge and knew he would never provide Jesus with 12 legions of angels at this moment, how can Jesus say at that moment God still has the ability to do that? Because he does. But read the next verse. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Must. So both are both are the same at the true at the same time that he has the ability to call in the legion of angels. So the ability and the possibility are there and that's something that he can do, but the scripture has already prophesied that that's not what will happen. And we can't conclude that it's not going to happen because the scripture says uh, that, that it must happen thus. So okay, both so are true at the same time. Right. It actually proves Dan and I's point really nicely. We God could do this, but, what must happen is what he foreknows. If God has the ability to do something, you guys, and we don't know because we don't know the future, whether or not he will act on that or not, that ability means the future is open. It's open to the fact that God might change what he foreknows. And I would argue that means open theism is true. Um, I know it's not our turn to ask questions, but you know, I, I'm not sure how you'd cash that out. Could you explain that a little bit more? Because I didn't, I didn't get that. Sure. If, if God knows he is not going to send 12 legions of angels to Jesus in that moment, how can Jesus say he could do it? Because the same way that I know I'm not going to quit my job tomorrow, but I could. Yeah. Right. I know I won't. Right. So what, what I'm saying is, is if God has the ability to change the future that he knows, that means the future by definition is open. If God can change what he knows will happen in the future, it's not settled. It could well, be changed by know, God himself. Then then I would ask what you mean by knows the future. 
I'm using your position, which is he knows everything that will happen exhaustively and it cannot change. Right. It must happen so that scripture should be fulfilled. It, the, mu the it must happen, you see? So that means if we go back to the original question, if God knows X will happen, can God make Y happen instead? You're saying not really because it must happen the way he knows it. So, so I guess what I've been trying to get across is the difference between can happen and will happen. But let me put it in a different way. Maybe I can. Uh, so there's a difference between causation, you know, cause and effect, you know, build, you know, billiard ball hitting another billiard ball causation. And then also, I guess I would say um, knowledge or logic. Those things are not the same thing. You know, causation is not the same thing as logical connections or knowledge claims. And so I think you're crossing fields from causation into logic. No, I'm definitely not doing that. Uh, Dan, don't you agree that God actualized a particular world? Isn't that part of your uh, theology? Um, yes. Now, I, just let me let me caveat. I've already agreed with Dane that I would leave Molinism out of this. I, I welcome that, you to a dis separate discussion on Molinism. Yeah, no, no um, problem. But if you believe that God actualized a particular world, isn't it also part of your theology that that actualized world will not change, cannot change? Will not change, yes. Cannot change, no. Of course it can change. Okay, great. So I, I'm actually fully content with this because if God has the ability to change what he foreknows, then that means the future is not settled, but it's open. Again, we're not arguing exactly what God is going to do, but if he has the ability to, that makes the future open. Yeah, and our argument is that Jesus thought this way, uh, as evidenced by the verse we read. So I'm going to read to you a different verse. Uh, 1 Samuel 2.30, Therefore the Lord declares, I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. Are we following so far? But now... The Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So what was God's original promise in the text? Right. Okay. So this is obviously, you know, kind of a conditional promise, right? So, so what, okay. what was the original promise per the text? Oh, I'm sorry. So you're on verse 30? Going in and out of the gates, correct? One, 1 Samuel 2.30. Yeah. Uh, he says, I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. So then, it, our, he says, then he says, I'll, I, I honor those who honor me. Um, what, what does, but now mean in, in time? Uh, so, so we hold Dan and I hold to uh, categories of both transcendence and eminence. Yeah. But what does, but now mean? So he said, I promised this would happen forever, but now far be it from me. So what's far from God? To honor those that don't honor him. Right. He's no, not, no, no. What's far from God is his original promise, right? Or no, what's far from him is what Dan said to that he's not going to honor people who dishonor him. Right. Well, okay, well, so what's far from him though? Though well, that's not far from him. That's his that's his new position, right? Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So so I would say it this way. Like on on Monday they're being faithful, and so God is going to reward them. On Tuesday, they're being faithful, so God is going to reward them. On Wednesday, they rebel, so God is no longer going to reward them. He's going to um, punish them instead. Except for what happened was God said, I promise that you'll be my people. My, my uh, e Eli, your, your sons will be go in and out before me forever. But now, but now I say far be it from me. The original promise far from me. Now mm -hmm. I'm going to replace it with a conditional statement that I'm going to honor whoever honors me. And I'm going to despise whoever despises me. Right. Is this mm -hmm. a unilateral promise being replaced with a conditional? No, it was always conditional. Always conditional. Then why why does he say but now? How if if it's it's if it's always conditional, why does he say but that, now? Is it your position that God is a promise breaker and a liar? No, I wouldn't say that because if I tell my kids we're going to McDonald's and then they start fighting and whining, it's not, I'm not breaking a promise by saying I'm not bringing you to McDonald's anymore. Because it was conditional that they would be in a good attitude. No, that wasn't even part of my original. When I said we're going to McDonald's, I honestly thought we're going to McDonald's. And when God says, I promised that your house would go in and out before me forever, I don't think God's lying. Your but, position seems to be the lie, right? But even even in that case, Chris, so your, your promise to your kids, wasn't it while they were being good? Right, because I, I didn't expect things to change. And so God said his promise was forever. Was God's promise a lie? Yeah, so 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 they so even your promise to their kids is to them while they're behaving. That's that's still an element of conditionality. But what does it mean? But now, 
Isn't that a change of process? So, so what, what's happened is that your kids, uh, and I, this is too personal, but let's, let's stick with the verse. So Israel, you know, or the, the Eli's sons change from being good to being bad. Right. That's what, that's what changed. And so the condition out, the condition just kind of kicked in. But the conditions weren't originally part of the promise and it, and the, but now is the conditions, right? Well, there've, there've been conditional promises, uh, from the beginning, right? So God doesn't have to repeat himself over and over. Uh, I, I see in the story of Jonah, there's obviously if, a conditional prophecy. So God promises in his law, those who keep it, I will bless and those who break it, I will curse. So, um, the conditions were set in stone in, in the time of Moses before Eli. Yeah. So if, if this, if conditionality was always a part of this promise, why does he say, but now, and then add the conditional? Well, you, even you wouldn't take, um, forever to mean literally forever in the, in the case of Eli and his sons, because you know that the uh, Messiah is going to be both King and priest in the order of Melchizedek. So that's not um, part of this text. No, I know, but I'm just saying that, uh, uh, there's, there was always a time when, when the priesthood would be replaced. Um, so there was by, by the way, him, now, by the way, you can only have a true conditional prophecy if open theism is true. That is correct. What? All right. So why, why can't God know uh, how people will, res will respond to the tr uh, condition? A conditional prophecy means there's the actual ability to do either one. Right. I, we both Dan and I believe in human free will. We just believe God knows human free actions, which we established in our first subtopic. So this verse does show a conditional being added after the fact, after conditions change. It was a unilateral, then it was changed well, to conditional. Do you think that um do you think that uh Eli would have been familiar with the law of Moses? Uh I probably irrelevant to this verse. It was about lineage, and God usually promises it to people who uh honor him, and Eli did. Well, uh, the, the thing is, is that the conditions are laid out in Deuteronomy around how God blesses those who keep his covenants and he curses those who break them. And then so sometimes, the like like with Abraham, there's unilateral promises that uh, he doesn't lie about and doesn't change about and goes through extraordinary methods to keep those promises, right? Right. So um, there are both conditional and unconditional. There are promises that um, there are certain promises that God puts his own name upon right like that messiah would come through the line of judah yeah, before, before we run out of time i want to highlight a comment tyler vela who you probably know dan and dane who agrees with you uh, on this topic he actually disagrees with what you guys said here's his comment god cannot change what he knows because he would have had a false belief that turns out to be something else so he actually is telling you that your admission that god can change what he knows is is not valid so uh, we, I, I'm an Arminian, um, and Tyler is a theistic determinist, Calvinist. So yeah, but that's no not relevant to this point. Well, it, I think it's I very think, relevant. And, and with respect yeah. to Brother Tyler, I would just yeah. say that um, Dan and I's handling of uh, the Matthew 26 text is going to be a lot uh, easier than than his. <laughs> All right, guys, enjoying it. Um, we are going to jump into the last uh, subtopic led by our Arminians, um, and that is foreknowledge. The, the last of two, because we got one more for open theism. Yeah, the last of uh, last. Yes, of the, la the last one led by the Arminians, uh, and then we've got one more led by uh, the open theists. Uh, so foreknowledge in election. Take it. Dan, you lead this one, brother. Oh sure. Um, so let's take uh, let's let's take for example um, Ephesians one. Uh, so it basically uh, let me pull it up real quick. I apologize. I should have been prepared. Okay. So Ephesians one four. Um, uh, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without uh, blame before him in love. Okay. So who was chosen before the foundation of the world according to the text? Uh, people to be in Christ for a relationship with uh, God. Okay, so which people? He's always wanted a group. The remnant is spoken about throughout the Bible, and the remnant is a dynamic group, which names get added to the Book of Life and names get removed from the Book of Life. And so it's a corporate people. This is, yeah, th this is, this is according, like an, oh, go ahead. So according to open theism, you know, could 
everyone just simply have rejected and no one have been in this group. Well, God can raise new children of Abraham from the rocks. And so God is smart and innovative and able to get his plans accomplished. Okay, so uh, so God is able to cause people to love him? No, no. but if you create enough people, there, there's going to be people who love him. On open theism, God did God know that for sure? Or wasn't it possible that all of them wouldn't love him? When, no Ephesians one, when Ephesians 1 was written by Paul, there were already saved believers. Could they not have, in an open future, yeah. all apostatized? Yeah, and so John wow. the Baptist actually takes care of this conditional. It's like if all of Israel rejects God, he can make new children of Abraham from the rocks. Because God is smarter than the, the roadblocks we want to put on God's plans. Oh, God can't fulfill this plan because... I don't know how that would happen. God's smarter than us. God can accomplish his goals. So, so Will, I, I agree with you at the time of the writing of the epistle that, you know, there was already a church in Ephesus, of course. But the epistle also dates this event to what time frame? Are you sp speaking about before the foundation of the world? Right. Cool. So, yeah. So, two things. Number one, this does not prove that God has exhaustive knowledge of the future. I feel like I should point that out because that's the topic of the debate. Two, uh, what I believe this is saying, and by the way, I think most Arminians agree with, uh, with me here, is that this is not individual but corporate election, and this is simply saying that God has a plan. So for example, when an airline sets up a plane to fly from one city to the other months in advance, the destination of that plane is predestined, and people freely choose to go on that plane, but they don't know exactly who's going to buy a ticket and board. Okay, so I guess two questions. You know, what's the purpose of this plane according to the text? To be, uh, uh, you know, holy and blameless. <laughs> okay, so great. Okay, so um, does that imply that there were people that God at least knew people would be unholy and under blame? And this is like his uh, solution to that problem of there being blameworthy and unholy. Yeah, God yeah. had to implement new ways of saving people, grafting in the Gentiles because of unforeseen circumstances. Paul writes that the Gentiles are grafted in uh, to provoke the Jews to jealousy, and they're given a different method of salvation, one that doesn't include Old Testament law, in order to uh, further that that jealousy. So, and so yeah. yeah. So but if, that was always God's plan. Uh, the prophets write about how Israel would be a light to the nations. The yeah, in a, yeah, the Gentiles were always meant to be in a subservient role, that they would bring gifts to Israel and they would be outsiders. But Paul's dispensation, which, which was widely rejected by the Jews, was that Gentiles were fellow heirs and fellow members and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 3, 6. In, and in so this is a change. In the context of Acts uh, chapter 15, um, it, it's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles both being, um, you know, saved and in the Council of Jerusalem. And fifteen eighteen says that God knew these works uh, from, you know, times eternal, or I, I forget the exact um, language. He, know, he knew all his works uh, from the beginning. Yeah, that's, that's so, not disputing anything I said about the Old Testament arrangement with the Gentiles. Well, it, 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 would, uh, it sounded like you were saying subservient, it, um, but the New the New Testament would say that it was always God's plan to unite in in, in Christ, uh, Jew and Gentile, and seeming to be on an equal. You know, there is no no longer uh, slave nor free, Greek Greek nor Jew, male nor female, but all are one in Christ. Yeah, no there there's always a hierarchy. That was a change. But uh, I want to get back to the foreknowledge and election. And um, in uh, in John ten, Jesus says that he has other sheep that he must collect. Um, and this is speaking about Gentiles. And um, he, he's still in his ministry in Israel, right? But he knows that there are some that he must collect that are Gentiles. And he, he seems to act as though he already possesses them in that present moment. Says, I, I have these sheep um, that I have to go collect. Uh, now, in your perspective, how could he know that he already possesses them? Well, well, he had a tasking from God, like uh, he's, he's tasked to go do things. And sometimes those taskings 
more or less come true with exceptions. Like he, he was tasked to keep all that came to him. And then in John, it writes that there's one exception and that was Judas. So that prophecy could be fulfilled. And so, yeah, he, he has a tasking and a plan and elements of that can fail his tasking. Wait, so if God predestines something, can it is it, can it not happen? So predestine is kind of a loaded word within within uh, ancient use of that word. That just means to specify something at a previous point of time. And so when you're reading it in normal contexts that are not in the Bible, you wouldn't be able to identify the word because usually it's just talking about a past action and someone just saying something. And so predestination is God has said something at, at some point previous. So, well, I'd like you're your... destined to conform believers to the image of Christ, right? So there's a very specific thing that he predestines us for. Yeah, God having plans is open theism. Will, you had something to add? Yeah, can I respond to John 10? Yeah. yeah. In John 4, verse 39, we have Samaritans who already believed. So this is referring to uh, people that had already believed. This isn't future. Well, I would disagree with that because... Um, there are people who believed in in God who don't end up being saved in the new covenant. So there are people who are in the old covenant who aren't saved in the new covenant. Pharisees would be a pretty good example of that. So uh, you have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ to be saved under the new covenant. The people um, before his resurrection, you know, weren't, weren't believing in that. Well, hold on a second. Are you saying that people that died before he, he died, uh, I guess I, I don't understand what you're saying. John 4.39 says, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him. Yeah, that he was the Messiah. Because of the yeah. word of the woman who testified. Right. If, if they had died that day, they'd be, they'd be saved uh, the same right. way Abraham was. But I, I'm talking about if you, if you carried over in life, take um, you know, Cor uh, Cornelius or Lydia, if you carried over from the old covenant to the new covenant, you have to believe and be baptized, right? Well, I, I don't believe you have to be baptized, but that's a different debate. Well, well, I'm not saying, well, I said believed and be baptized. You you have to believe, you have to uh, at least meet the uh, belief in the resurrection. There, there was a transitional period where there seems to be overlap in dispensations. But I, are, are you a dispensationalist? Is this what we're talking about? Okay. No, I'm not a dispensationalist. I'm, uh, I'm covenantal. So the old covenant and the new covenant are different and the conditions are different. In the yeah, new covenant, yeah. you have to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah, the believers who were baptized in John's baptism, who hadn't heard of Jesus's, they're not going to go to hell if they died right after Jesus died. Right? Well, that's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying like the thief on the cross didn't see him rise from the dead, right? And he was saved. I'm talking about someone like, because um, Will, was, Will was talking about how the Gentile sheep in John 10 is, is just talking about the believers, uh, Gentile believers or something that were already God fearers. Um, I'm saying that Jesus is talking about those in the future who uh, will believe in him through the ministry of the apostles, right? Jesus even prays for those people. Th that's a good question. Who is Jesus praying for uh, in, in John 17, according to an open theist? You know, he says, I pray not only for you, but those who will believe through your word. Clearly, Jesus has people in mind to pray for that are future believers. Oh, well, I, yeah. I hear pastors pray that sermon all the time. They don't have to have a future foreknowledge of events to make that prayer. Right, but... but and not exhaustive know. knowledge. But Jesus is a mediatorial high priest, though. Well, hold on a second. What verse? Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head. It's in John 17. I'll Google it. Okay. It's By the way, Bible. John 10, while you're Googling that, Jesus does not say that he's referring to people after the resurrection and ascension. So I, I apologize if I could, uh, it's a slight switch of topics, but I wanted to get back to, Will, what you said about corporate election. So I think the issue that I have is twofold. Um, one, there's no purpose for corporate election unless God foreknew the fall. And if God foreknew the fall, then open theism has lost all its, you know, I guess, sizzle in terms of uh, the problem of evil. And then two, that I think if God doesn't know the future and who all the believers are, I don't know what corporation means anymore because, again, you have... I didn't get that, unfortunately. Uh, you're, you're, turning, you're turning into a robot. I, I'm sorry? 
What, you what, turn, what did I just do? Uh, you your need a, uh, connection was breaking. Oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, sorry. I, uh, I'll run that, run through that real quickly. So if, if on a corporate election with open theism, I think I see two issues. One, there's no purpose for corporate election unless God knew the fall. And if God foreknew the fall, then open theism has lost all its advantage in terms of explaining the problem of evil. And then two, that if God doesn't know who f the future believers are, it's the empty set. It's not a collective corporate election that's grouped together of all these different people that will believe. And you've got the risk of an empty set that God is literally predestining nothing. It says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, what did he chose us? That we should be blameless and holy before him in love. That was Adam's purpose before the fall. You don't have oh, to have a fall right. to have this plan of God to have a people group. Can you read all the way to verse seven? Yeah. Uh, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our, our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. The through his blood is the point that would be um, important to highlight. The sacrifice of Christ was um, known in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. Except that for the way that he would sanctify us, and there would be no need for a sacrifice without sin. There's a lot of dependent clauses, and you're just describing that this uh, dependent clause is modifying before the foundation of the world, which I don't think it is. Will? Hey, Dan, I agree with you that there is no point without the fall. But here's the difference. Uh, our position is there's no point without a fall. Okay? It it did not have to be Adam. It did not have to be Eve. It did not have to be that specific fruit on the tree. It did not have to be that specific day, that specific time. So when God decided to create the universe, he undoubtedly, the father undoubtedly had a conversation with the son and said, if we create human beings that have free will, they could sin. If they sin, you will have to become a man and die. Do you want to do this? And he agreed to do it. And so the cross was for if, and let's be realistic, when someone eventually with all of these humans re reproducing would sin. So God is predestining things based on, an, uh, on not just an if, but he could literally predestine something and it not come about. Of course. We see that throughout the whole Bible. It's, it's simply a contingency plan. What does, again, uh, okay. So actually, Chris, uh, we're running out of time. So Chris, to your point on the dependent clauses, I I agree with you, but it, the phrase in Christ, that we're elected in Christ, right? doesn't that mean through union with Christ, we get forgiveness of sins? Yeah, he's writing to a current audience. He's not saying from the beginning of the world, this is the case. Uh, okay, well, just as he chose well, us in him, before the foundation of the world. Yeah. Why are we chosen in Christ if it's not in talking about union to Christ? And that's how we get forgiveness. That's how because, we get blameless, blessedness. Because this, this verse is pointing out that Jesus is part of the Trinity and Jesus is instrumental in our pre-fall relationship with God. I listed a lot of... Uh, I listed a lot of verses in my opening statement, including 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 10, Ephesians 1, 4 through 7, which we've been talking about, 1 Peter 1, 20, uh, and Titus 1, 1 through 3, all of which talk about the necessity of redemption through Christ being known uh, before creation. Yes, um, we and agree 100%. And blood of Christ and all of that. Um, so again, I think uh, it's clear that God knew the f that in the future humans would sin and um Right. If those well, were really proved your point, you would have brought those verses up and not this one. Well, hold on a second. I well, know. I said them all in my opening statement. When my wife is pregnant, I know that my child is going to sin. <laughs> that, that's pretty easy to know. And so I, I think we need to be careful here. And I think you guys might be a little bit guilty of, of creating a straw man that our position is if God doesn't know everything, he knows practically nothing. All right, guys. Uh, it's been good. We've enjoyed it. Um, we're going to get into the last segment here led by the Open Theist. And um, it's going to be on the subtopic of uh, Exodus 32. God changes his mind here due to outside input. Um, 
and you guys may want to read it, but this is the passage where God is angry with uh, the children of Israel and their idolatry. And he tells Moses that he just wants to wipe them out and start fresh with Moses. And then Moses pleads with God not to destroy them. And then verse 14 says, the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. All right. Um, so you guys can take it away. Um, just a reminder, everybody that's watching right now, if you have a question that you'd like me to ask here after this is completed, um, go ahead and let me know in the live chat. And um, instead of putting just at practical faith, if you just type it all caps, that's a little bit easier for me to see on the, the platform that I'm using here. All right. You guys take Okay, great. Dan and Dane, do you believe God repents, meaning he changes his mind? Yeah. Y yes. I mean, I think we need to fine tune that. What Where we'll push back is that it's not based on new information that he didn't already have. And, but and is yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Dan. Yeah, go ahead. So, well, well yeah, go can, ahead. can I jump in? Um, the the Bible, all four of us believe in inerrancy and infallibility, correct? Yes. Okay, that's great. So premise one, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. Premise two, the Bible says God cannot change his mind like a man. Numbers 23, 19. No, no, <laughs> no it, doesn't. it doesn't. And now we're um, off topic. Well, so no, no. Let me, let, me, let me make my point. Okay. What, how, uh, what's, what's your quote of numbers? Well, it's not God it, speaking. It it's not the narrator speaking. It's a false prophet speaking. And so if you want to quote false prophets for your theology. No. Uh, hold, hold on. Sorry. This is so important. You guys, this, this topic is very important to us. Dan, you said that you believe God repents, and I define that as it means he changes his mind. So are you going to stick with that so that we can continue? I think it needs to be fleshed out more, but it's in, in the sense that there, uh, Israel was under a sentence of judgment, and an, an appropriate judgment, before Moses interceded and before they repented. Once mm -hmm. Moses interceded and once that Moses repented, then um, God reversed that sentence of judgment. So, okay, and, and again, we'll, we'll get into Exodus 32. I was just asking generally, does God repent, meaning he changes his mind? In, um, a, in a narrow sense, yes. There's, there's obviously a, a sense in which uh, God, God doesn't. But where, where I think the point of contention between us will be, does he repent based on new information? And the answer to that is no. All right, I'm well, going to let Chris take over and well, go walk through Exodus 32 because I think we're going to be able to show that God does repent based on new information. All can, right, I, next, can I finish my thought uh, that I was going to try to make? On numbers? Yeah. Quickly. Okay. Because uh, Balaam, um, yeah, he's, he, he is not a, a true prophet in, in the general sense, but God does speak through Balaam. But anyway, I don't even need Balaam because there's other places in Scripture where God talks about how he does not change his mind. And so if you have, uh, you have other places where God says he changes his mind or repents. And so in Scripture, if we want to hold to inerrancy and infallibility, we have to say, okay, this looks like a contradiction, but we have to be able to figure this out. One must be literal and one must be metaphorical. Uh, one must be no. morphic. And so the no. way that I did That's... dish this out, the way that I dish this out is that the one that is more like a man would be the anthropomorphic one. And it's more like a man to change your mind Therefore, that's the anthropomorphic. Yeah, we have we have two characters in the text saying God doesn't change his mind, and we have Real God quick. saying he changes his mind like 30 times. And so I'm hey, going to go with God over Dan, characters in the text. You, you just created a false dichotomy, and you said if we have two that contradict, only one of them can be literal, and the other one has to be metaphorical. That's 100% false. It's very simple. The Bible says 26 times that God repents. It says twice that God does not repent. When you read the story... The two times where it says God does not repent, he's saying he will not repent in that specific instance. Chris, take it right. away. So Exodus 32, I'm just going to kind of flash through this. Uh, God is on Mount Sinai. He sees the people has become ev evil. Uh, he becomes angry and he says to Moses, I've seen this people. Behold, it's stiff necked. He says, uh, let me alone that I may burn my wrath hot against them and consume them. But Moses implored God and said, oh, God, you brought these people out of Egypt. These are your people. He says, why should the Egyptians say with evil intent, he did bring them out and then he just killed them. Oh, these Egyptians are going to just say you're a death cult God. Then he says, remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel. Remember your promise, he says, which you swore by yourself. Recall that thing. And then God says, and that the text says, the Lord repented, uh, Nekam repented, the normal word for repent from the disaster that he's spoken of bringing upon his people. 
Now, did God listen to Moses? Did he take outside input and process it and then come to a decision from Moses? Is it your position that God was counseled by Moses and that um, uh, Moses had to correct God and, and um, call God to repent? Of, Chris uh, just asked problems? you a question, and now you're asking him why. Yeah, this asked. debate's not about what I believe. You know, what my, is the my, text question was, my question was rhetorical because clearly you don't want to go there. So it was a statement in the form. If, if you're, if you're lead, leading the conversation, I'd go there. But uh, you know, we're, Okay, we're so, so um, the, the answer to your question is God uh, uses means uh, in, in order to achieve ends. This is, in my humble opinion, this is more about God shaping Moses to being the best prophet and leader that he can be. God is giving Moses the opportunity to intercede for his people. God is giving him an opportunity uh, to be a great high priest for his people kind of a thing. Um, Dan, do you agree? Yeah. So, okay. So the way I would say it is this, you know, um, it is true, hypothetically, let's say if Moses hadn't interceded and if the people hadn't repented, God wouldn't do this. But God knew that Moses would intercede, and God knew that the people would repent. And the reason why we know that is because God made a, a unilateral covenant with Abraham. He promised, and he, uh, in that promise, he literally div divided a piece of oxen, right? And then a fire right. path between the oxen. So is is your position that that's the reason he didn't destroy Israel? In, in, in part. So let me, let me, let me finish the thought, please. So God is literally saying, let this happen to me if I break my promise. So he's betting his life on it. So, right. so Moses in De Moses in Deuteronomy says, I was afraid he's, he's recounting this. This is actually a very, very famous episode within the Bible that a lot of people look back on and comment on. And so Moses is writing in Deuteronomy. He says, I was afraid of the anger and the hot displeasure, which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me. So Moses, he thought God listened to him. Is that the case? Moses? Yes. And in, in that sense, in the way I just described it, it is okay. true. Because yeah, I'm, Moses, I'm good with that. If Moses hadn't interceded, then God would have. But, but God knew that Moses would intercede. And he was so certain of it that he bet his own life on it. Okay, so God did not destroy Israel because of Moses. You'd say yes. Yes, yes. Okay, that's good because Psalms 106 recounts it. It says, therefore he said to them he would destroy them had not Moses his chosen one stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath lest he destroy them. So Moses seems to be instrumental. Which argument in particular, I read you all the arguments that Moses made to God, which was convincing to God? Which argument convinced God? His own covenant, his own faithfulness to his own covenant. All right. So in Ezekiel, it's recounting this and it actually gives a different answer than you. He says, mm -hmm. then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them and fulfill my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for my name's sake in that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles among whom they were in whose sight I have made myself known to them. So Moses's argument that if you bring Israel out to the wilderness and just kill them all, they'll think you're a death cult God. That is what the Bible says. The argument that Moses made, that's the reason that God changed his mind. Do you agree with Ezekiel? Well, yes, but that doesn't discount what Dan already said also. Uh, God's great name is attached to the promise he made to Abraham. So, Right, but God changed his mind for reasons that were proffered by Moses. But he knew he would. That's the point. He always knew he would, yeah. And if he didn't, he he's he's literally a liar in and only in your system in your system he's a liar he says he's going to do something and with uh, no intent of ever doing it in open theism true. you could be persuaded of something and so he says that he was going to do it i will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them that's what it says in ezekiel he says i will do this but i acted for my name's sake that should not be profane. So God listened to Moses' arguments, internalized it, and responded accordingly, according to future commentators on this incident in Exodus 32. You said this incident in Exodus 32 was a learning activity for Moses. What writers mm -hmm. in the Bible think that? Well, I didn't say that that was all it was. What, what, what Bible writers think that this is a learning activity for Moses? Well, I'm, I'm certain that uh, Moses learned from it. Right, but what by, this this is this is a debate about what's in the Bible, what the Bible says. Is there any biblical authors recounting this event that say, 
well, this was uh, a test for Moses. Moses is a hero. Moses is a hero of the faith and, and kept the faith according to Hebrews, um, you know, 11. And uh, so clearly he was he was learning how to do right by God. But in terms of what you're asking, the, the authors reflect on it as uh, God for his name and for his glory, relenting of this disaster after Moses interceded. I don't see why God why you, you don't think God could know that Moses uh, by the means of, of prompting Moses, he would intercede and then God would relent. Uh, because God, he says, he I will was, pour out my fury on them. But but Moses intercedes per Psalms 106 and gives arguments. And then God, but I acted for my own name's sake. So, so he I, responds to arguments. I think there's a detail that we need to focus on exegetically. So it's in verse 10, 32, 10. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them. So he's literally saying, leave me alone, then I'm going to destroy them. Uh, then I'm going to get so mad that I'm going to destroy them, right? So it's contingent on Moses not interceding. Right. Well, not in the recounting in Ezekiel, right? No, I'm just well, talking about okay. Exodus 32 for a moment because Dan's point is, is um, important. Uh, it, do you think that God knew Moses' heart in the present to know that he would intercede? Yeah, I do think so. Right. So when God says, let me alone, he already knows Moses isn't going to leave him alone. But God doesn't always respond to petitions of people. Sometimes he ignores them. He just doesn't want Moses to be that intercessor to change God's mind because God really wanted to kill these people and ma make a new people. This is this is a unilateral promise. And God innovated a new way to fulfill the promise. He'd start a new line through Moses, who was of the lineage of Abraham. And in that way, he could fulfill his promise because God is innovative. So well, God thought this out. The lineage of Judah, <clears throat> so it actually would have compromised God's. Yeah, promise. you keep no. It, what it, Genesis? Uh, what is it? Genesis forty nine that the scepter will not depart from Judah. Yeah, who's talking yeah. and in what context? And w that, that that that's a whole different thing. You don't believe it, Jacob was speaking uh, truly on God's behalf? There was a long time in Israel's history when there's no scepter in Jacob. Hold, hold on a second. You, you guys have already said those things are conditional. So. No, 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 well, no, no. not the, the, the unilateral Abraham promise Abraham. of the Messiah. Gen the Genesis three fifteen prophecy that um, the Messiah would would crush the head of the serpent. That's that's not, not a prophecy, but okay. <laughs> well, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. Go well, ahead, the, Chris. The covenant with Abraham that wasn't conditional. That here's, that's here's correct. The, here's the issue, Dan. Is that with Exodus thirty two, <clears throat> we don't have a single verse that says God changed his mind because of that covenant. But what we do have is something very specific. And I think I can, I can say it a little bit better than Chris did and make it a little bit more clear. In Exodus 32, Moses said, why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? So Moses brings an argument, which is if you destroy them, the Egyptians will have something against you. Now, when we go to Ezekiel, God says, but I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles, the Egyptians, among whom they were in whose sight I had made myself known to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt. He literally says the exact argument that Moses brought up is the reason he didn't do it. Right, right. But it goes back to God's covenant because the Egyptians wouldn't even have that argument if they weren't his people. Or the fact that the, that the Israelites were God's covenant people is why the Egyptians could point the finger and mock God if this was the case. No, so it's because he just led down, them out of Egypt, right? Said, no, it, this comes back down to his unilateral covenant. And if open theism is correct, then God is a covenant breaker. No, because he innovated a way to keep the covenant, and that's creating a new lineage through Moses. God knew the. Do you think God? Oh, uh, I'm not supposed to ask questions. Um, I would assert that God knew the words of Moses uh, before Moses spoke. So God, already, that, God knew he would intercede. God knew he would respond to his intercession. Well, then it was a game, and, and God lied to Moses to get it's him. It's not to a game. Something. It's um, it's a way for God to be imminent and personal. Um, it's, it, it, I, I, I think that the category of um, imminence is so important because God speaks to us in ways that are gonna help us um, relate to him and understand him. So I, I wouldn't call it a game. What, was God furious here? Yeah. Did, did God have hot anger? 
God has wrath against idolatry and sin, for does, sure. Does that affect God's mental state? Does he punish harsher towards people who he's mad at? Well, or, well or wait the, still- emotional, the emotional life of God is so far beyond what we can understand. Um, certainly, Scripture reveals God has emotions, but they're not um, unrestrained. Uh, they, they are... Um, they're far beyond human experience of emotion. Okay. So, but what you guys have admitted to from what I'm gathering is that Exodus 32 represents Moses convincing God and Moses convincing God with convincing arguments. Would you both agree to that? Yeah. And God always knew that that was how it was going to go. Right. And I would quickly add that it wasn't that um, Moses convinced God to, to stop being immoral and that God was going to do something evil and Moses talked him out of it. Thank you, Moses, for saving God from being a sinner. When, when God said, I will consume them and make of you a great nation, in your theology, that was a lie. No. No, it was conditional on the non-intercession of Moses, as I've already pointed out from verse 10. Right. If, if Moses had left him alone and God knew he wouldn't leave him alone, not a lie. All right, guys. Uh, I've enjoyed this. It's uh, it's been a good debate, good discussion. Um, it's prompted a lot of questions, a lot of questions for me personally on both sides. Um, so I put some of my own questions together, and then I've also taken uh, some from uh, people who have uh, submitted their questions, changed some of them up just a little bit. Um, and I'm not, I don't think we're going to get through all of them, but we do want to do like um, a few minutes of closing here. Uh, you guys kind of wanted to, to, put a bow on this, make it nice and neat. So uh, we didn't talk really about how we would, how we were going to do that. We're saying just, just a couple minutes, maybe a minute or two a piece. Um, and I guess Dan and Dane, would you like, like to go first? And I don't know which, which of you would like to, to close or I, I can go from one to the other and give you like a total of maybe three minutes or something. Sure. Um, I don't know if it even needs to be that long because I know we got to get to the Q and A. Um, right. Um, do like a, uh, give me eight, thirty a seconds. Yeah, thirty seconds. I mean, okay. I, I don't think we need to go too long on these. Okay, cool. Well, well let's just keep the screen like this, um, and then if you guys just want to kind of go, um, Dane, if you want to lead us, or Dan, either one, um, and then you other guys, and then we'll get to the questions because that's I know some people are waiting for. Um, Dane, it's up to you. I, I can go on ahead, but it's up to you. Uh, well, you, you go for it. Okay. So we've, we've given just many, many instances of God knowing the future, and behind those is a network of free choices. So if free choices are knowable, and since God's understanding, which implies his knowledge, is infinite, then God knows all future free choices. So that's the, that's the key thing. That's the kind of the debate right there. The rest of it is just hammering out the details of how that works. Then um, in terms of God's uh, claiming his deity based on um, knowing the future, we've seen that from Isaiah uh, chapter 40. And the test is, you know, when God says something, that's what comes about. And that's how you know that he's God. The same we see in, in John uh, 13. And then uh, lastly, with predestination, we see that it, that obviously implies that there's, a, you, know, you know, that God has a people. He knows who those people are before the foundation of the world. Otherwise, he's predestining nothing. Not only that, from what we've heard is that God can predestine things that don't happen. And if that's the case, then predestination just basically means nothing. And you might as well just cross it out and move on from, your, from that word in your Bible. Um, so I guess I'll just... I'll, I'll just leave it at that. The, there's just a mountain of evidence uh, that God knows things. Then we heard some interesting comments about God knowing things that are false. I think that shows some philosophical weaknesses on the open theist side, and as well as um, implications that God has a physical body and is, is located in space time. And that's how he learns things. So God knows the future because he physically sees them. Um, and that's not the way the scripture describes God at all. At all, God is a spirit, and uh, spirits don't have flesh and blood, as as Christ said in, in Luke uh, twenty four. So I'll I'll leave it at that. Well, are are we uh, alternating? Are we going to Dane next, or uh, you you go ahead, Chris? All right. 
Fantastic. All right. So I, I do want to remind everyone what this debate topic is. Does the Bible, not, not me, not Will, not Dan, not Dan, does the Bible teach that God knows the future exhaustively? I talked about categorically some bad arguments, just general phrases of knowing all things and even prophecy, just the way prophecy works, the, how flexible it is and how conditional it is. Uh, that's not good evidence for God knowing the future exhaustively. Yeah, God knows some things about the future. God has plans for the future. We admit that. But the Bible can Consistently, we have shown God learns. God learns because he sees. He learns because he does. He learns because he predicts. He tests to learn. He interacts with people. He listens to Moses. He listens and considers Moses' arguments and changes accordingly. God is the dynamic God. He's a changing God. He, he takes information and considers our pleas, the pleas, the prayers of his people. God is a responsive God, a personal God who changes. And just because of that, God is open will or uh dane yeah <clears throat> well before i say any concluding remarks i just want to thank uh cole for hosting and uh for dan for uh being on my team here and and for will and chris uh to debate us it's been fun and and uh i think done in a good spirit um I think so. does god know the future exhaustively does the bible teach that i uh am still convinced that he does um, and Dan mentioned all the reasons um, that I would mention. I think that uh, God's knowledge of future free actions hundreds of years in advance is very solid evidence that, that God does know the future. But I really think it gets to the heart of the gospel. Um, God knows my sins even before I was born so that Christ could die for my sins even before I was born. Um, I, I truly believe that Christ knew me on the cross, and I believe that Christ knew every believer and non-believer, for that matter, while he was on the cross, dying for real sins, not just this abstract concept of, of sin in general, but dying for the very sins, every lie I uttered in this life and will utter, every wicked thought um, that Christ really did die for me. And for, for him to, to know me that intimately and that personally before uh before I was even born, is um, staggering and wonderful. I take uh, I take Peter at his word when it says that Christ bore our sins bodily, and I believe I am a part of that um, hour. He bore our sins bodily. He would have to know me, and he would have to know my sins. I, uh, I believe Isaiah was talking about even me, and Chris, and Will, and Dan, and Cole, and all who are believers who are listening. Uh, Isaiah was talking about us when he said that um, God has engraved um, our names upon his hand. So the, the gospel requires this intimacy and this this knowledge of of even me um and i just want to close with this and and i hope this doesn't come across as too much of an attack but um i was i'm thinking a lot about this uh exodus 32 thing and i wanted to go to romans 11 starting in verse 33 oh the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of god how unsearchable are his judgments and untraceable his ways who has known the mind of the lord or who has been his counselor I would submit to you that Will and Chris's position makes Moses a counselor to God. And I can't accept that uh, because no man gives counsel to the Lord. All God's ways and deeds are perfect. And um, God knows from everlasting to everlasting how he will accomplish his will and good pleasure through perfect wisdom, perfect understanding, and yes, even perfect foreknowledge. Thank you. All right. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd like to you know, echo what Chris said, which is, I don't think we've heard any arguments tonight that God has specifically exhaustive knowledge of the future. Uh, Dan just said, this is a quote in his closing statement, there is a mountain of evidence that God knows things. We agree. He also said that this is a quote, we've shown many instances of God knowing the future. We agree, but uh, I don't believe the uh, exhaustive part was accomplished. Um, we uh, someone said in the debate, I don't remember who, that God does not learn. Uh, Hebrews 5.8 says that God learns and actually uses the word learn. Uh, Dane, you said early in the debate that uh, God knows us and knows our DNA in the womb. Uh, we absolutely agree with that 100%. That's present knowledge. You did say just now, Dane, in your closing statement that God knew me before I was born. That was not established biblically uh, in the debate. 
Uh, we were told that Psalm 147.5 says that God's knowledge is infinite, but it actually says his understanding is infinite, which I think is a very key distinction. Uh, we were also showed, uh, shown one or two verses that says God knows all things, but there was no attempt to, uh, to show that all things includes a non-existent future, which was uh, the topic of the debate. We were told that uh, God knowing the future is a key chief defining attribute of deity, but I don't think that the Bible says that. Um, and again, to be consistent, that you also have to say that God telling us the past is a key chief uh, attribute of deity, also doing good and evil. And uh, I'd like to say that Jonah, interestingly enough, Jonah 4.2 gives us what I would say are more defining attributes of deity, me meaning uh, higher uh, priority. <clears throat> and he says, sorry, give me one second here. Jonah says, I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who repents from doing harm. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys. Uh, I want to say thank you so much for being on the channel. I think you guys have uh, done a great job representing your positions. It's been a great debate. No yelling, screaming or cussing. So <laughs> thank you. Um, now we're going to jump into some Q and a time. Uh, so I've got quite a few questions. I don't think we're going to get to all of them. It's nine 28, um, central time right here. Uh, we're not going to go past, 10. Um, if you guys have to cut out early because we're going a little bit long, then totally understand. Um, but we'll go to around 10 o'clock and uh, we'll start it out here. Okay. Um, and then I'll, I'll ask the question like to the one side and you have, you know, maybe two minutes, try to keep your answers brief if possible. And then the other side will have a chance to flick for a quick rebuttal. Uh, we, I don't really want to go back forth, back and forth. Uh, so we'll try to keep it like that if we can. All right, question for the open theist. Um, and this is something that I've, I've kind of wondered uh, regarding your position. Does God know everything that is knowable? Like uh, you guys were talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, and I thought uh, that Dane and Dan brought up a good point about uh, something that had happened already. And it seems like God is going to examine whether this thing had happened already. So did God know that it had happened? Does he know everything, like all past and all current events, thoughts, everything, um, or, or no? Yeah, okay, great. So I'll start. Uh, Christians make a huge mistake, in my opinion, in telling God what he knows and has to know, what he does and has to do, where he has to be located, I think that's a big, huge mistake. So I'm going to give my definition for omniscience, which I think will answer this question, Cole. My definition for omniscience is God knows everything knowable that he desires to know. And I am never going to tell God that he has to know something in order to be God. He is free. And if he does not want to focus on filth, especially the kind of filth that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, he does not have to. Yeah, I, I would echo that. God can forget our sins. And if God didn't want to remember our sins, that's his prerogative. But the questions about what does open theism affirm? There's a wide spectrum of open theists. Some believe that this is God testing to see if they're going to continue like this. And they think he has present knowledge and past knowledge because some past knowledge is involved here. I take a more literal approach. I think he's actually going to verify the prayers which have come to him. As we see throughout the Bible, prayers going up to God. In Jonah, in the, in the beginning of Exodus, in the beginning of Job, there's a divine council scene. And so often we do find prayers going to God. I and mean, he's not forced to be anywhere. There's also theological positions that involve divine nescience and open theism. There's a book called God's Presence, uh, God's Absence in the Charismatic Presence, something like that, which uh, puts, puts, together, put, puts together a philosophical formula, like where there's sin in concentration, God is repulsed, and so metaphysically, God can't be at that location. So open theists run the spectrum. You just happen to be debating people far to the right of that spectrum tonight. Awesome. Dan or Dane? 
Yeah, I would say for starters, I mean, I think what some of what we heard here is just, I would say it's not business as usual as far as open theism goes, right? I, I don't think you'd, you'd find that kind of response from Greg Boyd or, or some of the others. But the, setting that aside, you know, the fact that the Bible saying God doesn't remember our sins or that sort of thing, that's obviously covenantal language in, in terms of God's actions. And it it is absolutely not saying that God has a faulty memory um, that... Uh, you know, so we talked about how, you know, God swore by himself and he couldn't swear by anyone greater. So he swore by himself. But if he's forgetting things, literally, he's like, you know, worse off or he's actually a kind of on this learning curve. And so God could have waited and he could have sworn by somebody greater because he just waited a couple of weeks and he'd forgotten things that he shouldn't know. And he's learned more things and he's just a better God. So the funny thing is the the I will forget your sins and remember them no more. That's within Isaiah 40 through 48. Yeah. Okay. Dane, did you want to add something? Well, I just think that our, our open theist friends, um, they, they like to pick and choose what's literal and what's metaphorical. So, um, you know, uh, it, if it's literal that God has to go down and check out Sodom and Gomorrah before he knows, then, then that, uh, hurts their literal interpretation of God's eyes are everywhere and, and watches the world everywhere. So, um, to me, there's, there's a lack of consistency in, in which things they're going to take literally and in which metaphorically. So the God's eyes are angels within Zechariah, right? God has seven eyes that wander the world searching, right? Eyes are angels. Is that not true? Yeah. All right, let's uh, let's jump into the next question. The next question is for our Arminian brothers. Um, can God learn new things? Um, and, and I would include in that like his own actions. Like, was there a point when he didn't know what he was going to do? Um, and I think the implications with that would be that um, all of our actions, like you and I included, like we would be, within the mind of God for all of eternity past, we would be as old as God himself. If we were, um, if God never went from not knowing to knowing, does that make sense? It's not necessarily like a biblical question. I guess it's more philosophical, but, um, do you guys want to take a crack at it? Well, I'd like to jump in right away because, um, I, I was hoping I'd have an opportunity to say this, uh, after the closing statements, um, the passage that will brought up about God learning is, is in the context of the incarnate son. Um, and so no one disagrees that Jesus is fully human and learns. So that's not the same as, uh, the Holy Trinity's transcendent mind, right? Um, there is, uh, there is two natures. Um, Christ is fully God and, and fully human. The, the human nature does learn. It, it talks about in Luke somewhere early in Luke that he grew in wisdom and and strength. So um, clearly the incarnate son uh, does learn. But I would reject the category of God learning because I believe that, um, you know, God doesn't change and to acquire new information is certainly a change. So I would point to passages like James 1.17 that God doesn't change. Um, I think it's Hebrews 13, 8, that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So uh, to me, you you can't have a, a God acquiring information. That would be a change. You would not be the same person uh, today if you had more information than you did uh, yesterday. Um, that, that would be a change. And also, if God is perfect, um, then he needs nothing added on to him. And so I believe God is eternally perfect. And so he doesn't need information added on to him. Um, so I, I would reject the idea that God learns, but I wouldn't reject the idea that Jesus as a man learned. Um, I think that would be a, a really silly thing to argue. And so the mystery of the incarnation is beautiful and it's, it's wide and it's deep and it's part of the heart of the gospel uh, that the very creator entered his creation. Um, so uh, that's that's how I'd answer that, that, that God doesn't learn, the incarnate Christ uh, learns. Okay, and Dan, before you, you jump in, um, just to kind of be clear, would you say that you existed in the mind of God for all of eternity past? Okay, <laughs> go ahead. 
Yeah, so there are passages, I think it came up like God counts the stars or something like that, but it's not like God comes across this sky that he didn't know before and then starts counting them up, right? He created them. So right. this goes back to the point of creation. So we have passages like, you know, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we can look at that and say, oh, there's something interesting about time at this point, right? Because in the beginning, right? So usually theologians would put a, like a logical order, you know, to it in terms of, God's, you know, decision to create X number of stars explains, you know, his knowledge that there's X number of stars or that sort of thing, but we wouldn't say it's a causal or a chronological ordering. Okay. Thanks for that, Dan. Yeah. Will? If you guys go ahead. Okay, great. So, uh, Dane, I don't think you meant to say this. And I think if you rewatch it, you might want be like, oh man, I wish I would phrase that differently. But you just said God doesn't learn, but the incarnate Christ does, which implies that the incarnate Christ is not God. Um, Hebrews, well, me, yeah. Hebrews 5 8 is talking about Jesus experiencing something new. It's called experiential knowledge. And so he actually did learn something new through the incarnation, which is what it was like to be a man. So that is that is something that God learns. And, yeah, uh, please, uh, please forgive me um, if I was sloppy with my Trinitarian. Uh, obviously, I, I hold to the full deity of Christ. Um, what I was trying to express was that um, there are two natures um, in the incarnation. So he's fully God and fully man. This is worked out not only scripturally, but in the creeds of the church as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so there isn't, uh, you know, for example, we wouldn't think that... Uh, uh, God can die, but Jesus dies, right? So that's what I meant. Um, Jesus learns, uh, Jesus dies. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that the Godhead in its fullness dies. I think the human nature of Jesus dies. Agreed. It's about two natures. That's that's what's important. Yeah, but the problem is, is that the, the two natures are not two persons, okay? And by the way... But by, by the way, Dane, you also said uh, just now that God doesn't change, which the incarnation refutes. God became a man. That's that's a huge change. Um, not for the divine nature, though. It's not a change of the divine well, nature. It's an adding. It's an adding on of the human nature. The divine nature is adding change. a change. Hey, hold on a second. Hold on a second. This is crazy. When did I say the divine nature changed? You, you didn't. But the okay, person, great. So the person changed because he took on a new nature. Well, in my argument, the gaining information is a change. That's, okay. that's, yeah. So Correct. I think open theists have a hard time with the change. And God the Son gained something brand new, which was experiential knowledge of what it was like to be a human. So he learned something that he had never experienced before and did not know what it would be like until he did it. His human nature did not know what it was like until he did it, yes. No, no, no. His, his human nature is not a person. You're creating a fourth person of the Trinity. There's only one second person of the Trinity that has two natures. And by the way, change is defined as succession. And so, yes, the incarnation is 100% a change. I never said the divine nature changed, but you have to have a change to go from one nature to two. You have to have that. Okay, so I, I think the key thing is that the divine nature did not change. And I'm glad we agree on that. All okay. right. Uh, I'll, I'll go back to the question, does God learn throughout the Bible We've shown time and time again, God tests to know. God watches to know. Genesis 1 was brought up. God creates, then God sees, and then God evaluates and says, oh, this is good. God learns throughout the Bible. We don't have any other mechanism. We don't have this innate, ungenerated, non-discursive knowledge that an unchanging God would require. Instead, we have God responding to people, their arguments, and changing what he's going to do based on their arguments. God learns. Hey, okay. Chris, uh, can, I, can I jump in real quick with one thing? I know you got to get to the next question, but in Genesis 1, you brought it up. Is Are you of the opinion that God could have made a creation that wasn't good? He, well, he it might be implied in the text, but the plot, uh, the it's like an artist. An artist builds something, and like I draw sometimes, and I draw it like, oh, that's pretty good. And so, yeah, there's there's some things in creation that God doesn't like, right? Is that true? He or doesn't false? like sin, but yeah. Um, so, but he he, when he creates, I don't think he uh, thought, man, I hope I get this right, because he does things perfectly out of his perfect wisdom and understanding. So, uh, the idea that he learned that his creation was good after he made it, 
to me, he knew he was going to make a good creation and he declared it. I mean, that's I I think that's a really tough argument for you to sell that, that God was God like, saw that, that was good. good. Yeah, no, it, I'm not. My, I'm, I'm just reading the text. God saw that was good. Yeah. Let, me, let me jump in here, guys. Uh, we're going to get to a couple more questions. Um, this question is for the open theists. Um, and of course, you'll both have the opportunity to respond. Um, and I'm kind of going to mush a couple questions together. One. Um, do you believe, uh, like, was the cross like plan B or was this thought out before the foundation of the world? And then also, um, could Jesus have failed, uh, as in not been crucified? Uh, go ahead. Okay. Can I start? Will, is that okay? Yes. Okay. So I've, I've taken a look at these texts like Ephesians to try to really get to well, like what, what uh, dependent clause modifies what, and what I understand from it is God has always had a plan for a remnant. You find remnant theology throughout the Bible. God always wanted a people group. His first interaction with Adam is calling the animals to Adam to see what he's going to call them because God loves people. We're made in the image of God. He wants this relationship. So it's always been a goal. And then you have something called the fall that happens, which uh, puts a dent in his relationship. And the entire story of the Bible is God trying to reclaim that relationship with mankind. And so God has this goal of a people. Jesus was part of that goal. Jesus was part of this original interaction. And the cross was one of the methods by which God can reconcile the people to him. And Elseth, in his book, he says, okay, what if, what if Pilate and all the Jews, they didn't they all repented and worshiped God. Does Jesus still have to be crucified? And he argues he could have done it like a sacrificial lamb, like we see throughout the Bible where a lamb is brought to an altar and sacrificed before God. It could happen in that way. So the cross, it was God's plan. God's real plan was a people group that he could commune with. And the cross was one of the methods that God used to actualize that. Will? Okay. Some people might consider this a cheap shot, but I think this is very important. So what I'm going to do, Dan and Dane, and I've never done this, is I'm going to turn the tables on you and I'm going to use your argument that you used against us against you so that you could see how it feels. Okay. Okay. So when we were asking if God could change something that he knows will happen, you said he can, but he won't. So I'm going to I'm going to use that exact answer right now. Jesus could, but he won't. It's not very satisfying, is it? So you're saying that Jesus could um, have not died for our sins, but he but he won't. won't do that. Yeah, interesting. Well, well, we know he didn't have to. But he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says, uh, he prays, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. He prefaces it because he understands God responds to prayers, and he understands that God's going to be paying attention to his prayer. So he has to hedge against God changing what God's plans are based on Jesus's immediate needs, because Jesus understands he can change the mind of God. Hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. So I, I think when, when the way I would respond to that is, you know, if, if in that case, then if God knew that Christ would die on the cross, right? Otherwise, you know, there's not a change from anything unless that's what God actually knows will happen. What's changing at that point, unless that, that is settled, not open. And then this, the second thing I'd say is that in terms of Christ's death, it's not just known, it's actually predestined that, we, you know, we're predestined in Christ before the foundation of the world in Christ. And that's a, the solution to the problem. The problem is what? Sin, that we're unholy, that we're blame, uh, under blame. And so th those things uh, are f both foreknown and predestined. So it's a little... So, so real quick, the word pro arizo is used within the ancient wor world. And let me just read you a quick sentence using it. And this is the English translation. This is from Plutarch. Let so much suffice for general occasion of freedom of speech that there are also particular occasions which our friends themselves furnish that one who really cares for his friends will not neglect or make use of. Which word is pro arizo? Which word is predestination? Um. I'm sorry. Why don't you clue me, clue me in? Which one is it? 
It's it's furnish. They they they, they specify yeah. uh, elsewhere. It's used for yeah. specifying, just saying something. So yeah, it's. Yeah. I think that's it's, true. So it's, it's not like a fatalistic feeling. Yes. So of the possible things, God has specified one. That's the one that's going to happen. That's that is predestination. I agree with that. Um, but where, where I would disagree with it is it, it's not like a human plan that, you know, maybe can change and it's flexible and that sort of thing. It's a divine plan and it's a divine specification of all the possible things that God could do. This is the one. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, and you risk um, in, in your interpretation, you risk turning Jesus into a false prophet because he prophesies that he's going to die and rise. And you, you risk turning Isaiah into a false prophet with Isaiah 53 and David and Psalm 22 and, uh, you know, um, every, the whole scripture would unravel. And of course, we know that uh, Psalm 119.89 says that God's word is settled in heaven forever. And so um, Christ going to the cross uh, certainly had to happen. Uh, it was not, there was never a, a chance that it wasn't going to happen. Yeah, if you read Psalms 22, you're not going to find a prophecy. What, what people in the New Testament did is they showed parallelism. This is talked about by Michael Heiser, by Joel Hoffman, by Bart Ehrman. It's parallelism. It's not prophecy. And so well, things okay. happen cyclically. Well, but even, even if it's not a genre of prophecy, all of Scripture points to Christ, right? So Jesus on the walk to um, Emmaus, he says uh, he opens up where Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms spoke of him. Uh, and on Pentecost, full of the Holy Spirit, Peter is applying Psalms uh, 16, 110, and, and maybe some others to Christ. Uh, he clearly learned that from Jesus himself in those 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead. That's my that's my guess, at least. Yeah, so, we, we don't, we don't yeah. deny any of that. The whole Bible points to Jesus, but Jesus yeah. himself thought that the cross could be subverted as evidenced by his prayer in the garden. Well, but I would I would actually not say that he is evidencing that it could be subverted. He said... Um, through the whole time, he was saying that this this has to happen. I, I have to give my life as a ransom for many. That's the very reason I came. And so, you know, taking one very uh, uh, interesting prayer um, and, and trying to make that topple all these other statements of Jesus prophesying his death and saying the necessity of his death and the absolute certainties of his death. Um, to me, you have you have so much more evidence on the side of it has to happen. It will happen. It must. Right. Happen. He has to make it happen. So often in the Bible, like uh, you have to fulfill a prophecy of that. Jesus is counted among the sinners. Then they go out and they buy swords because they're making it happen. So Jesus in the, in the sense where you're saying this has to be fulfilled. He has to make it fulfilled. Right. Cause it's God's divine plan that he. Yeah. Fulfilled. And, and he's in tune with it, but it's not a fatalistic thing. It's not like there's well, I would never use. I would never use the term fatalistic either. Um, I believe that God works out his uh, will according to his good pleasure. All right, let, let me let's jump in here, guys. Uh, I've got a couple more questions to get to. I didn't jump in sooner because I'm enjoying this, and I think it's a, an important part of the discussion. Um, but I want to get to a couple more. Uh, okay, for the Armenians. Um, and this is a little bit uh, subjective, I guess. Um, but are there any prophecies uh, that... God could not bring to pass with infinite power and um, an omniscience as defined by the open theist. That's, you know, if that is knowing all things past and current, including the hearts and minds of people, is there any specific prophecy you can think of that could not be accomplished by that? Anything in scripture that was prophesied or something that I'm just coming up with? Cause God uh, can't in scripture. Okay, because yeah, God can't deny His nature, so there are things we could come up with that you know God couldn't do, like sure. lie or cheat or steal or whatever. This uh, was I, specifically I, prophecy. Yeah, I, I yeah. think the question is which prophecy in the Bible, in the open theist model, if open theism is true, just assuming open theism is true, which prophecy in the Bible couldn't God bring about? Would God be unable to do with infinite power and knowledge? So I think the, the 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 rub is I think it was it was mentioned in the open theist way right and I think where we probably saw that clearly and people can go back in the debate and look at it is when we talked about the Matthew um, twenty six when uh, Christ said that it, can't I call on a, a, a legion of angels but uh, but how then would the scripture be fulfilled that these things must be 
Um, so in the open theist way, that just doesn't work. So in the open theist way, no, he, you know, he can't fulfill all these prophecies because in, in essence, um, that would be, I guess, a violation of their view of free will. Was there a specific prophecy given there? I missed it. Oh, uh, that these things must be that in, in essence, that Christ was going to be crucified. Um, right. Cause this was in the context of Peter, um, um, trying to stop the crucifixion. Okay, so hold on really quick. Um, you're saying that that God and Jesus could not have uh, done the crucifixion without uh, exhaustive foreknowledge? No, okay, so God could not have used the open theist way of fulfilling prophecy because the open theist uh, way of fulfilling prophecy literally... Um, can't account for the fact that something was going to happen, something will happen, but the opposite could happen. That didn't seem to fit within your worldview. Yeah, but the question is only asking uh, if if God could make a, a prophecy happen without well, foreknowledge, and God could absolutely ha have done the crucifixion without like, foreknowledge. Like, is well, there a specific... No, um he would have to know Sorry. that Romans created crosses for torture. No. You know, there's all sorts of free choices it, that God would have to know uh, for the crucifixion to happen. If crosses didn't exist, that, God could just make one. Well, but then it wouldn't be a crucifixion. Why oh, not? God would just make a cross? Sure, he can. Yeah, the question is... Well, then he would have foreknowledge that he's going to uh, make a cross. Right. In open theism, is there a prophecy that infinite amount of knowledge and power could not be fulfilled by God. Um, is, is there any prophecy that God could do without omnipotence and omniscience as I describe it? Is that what we're asking? No, no. It, if you, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the open theist okay. and look at Daniel 12. That's probably the most detailed prophecy in existence. Could God in open theism, in the open theist model, could God, uses power to bring that about well uh it de uh, it depends on how much we want to take seriously um free will right so a lot of free actions have to go into place um for all these kingdoms and kings and yeah god god could send like a bunch of nanobots to move my body to make me do things right yeah, but, that would be a, certainly overriding your free will. That's fine. Uh, God does that all the time. He takes over Nebuchadnezzar and turns him into a wild beast. In right, open right. theism, can God send a bunch of nanobots to control everyone's body throughout all the reign of Daniel 12 to make that prophecy happen? Well, so, well then you're no different than uh, the Calvinists um, who, who would say... Uh, that's fine, know. but can God do it? Well, again, God has the ability to do whatever he wants. He knows what he's going to do based on his perfect knowledge and wisdom. But I, So you're, you're I putting yourself... Power. The question puts you in the open theist shoes. So you're an open theist for this question. Can God, does he have the power to send nanobots to force Daniel 12 to happen? Yes, right, I see, I see logically your perspective. Um, I just don't think it's biblical. Yeah, so I, th I think I think you're asking for an internal cr critique of the consistency, and the inconsistency is in Daniel eleven thirty six, where he says the king will do according to his will, and that doesn't that's inconsistent with saying God controls the king via nanobots. Those two things can't happen at the same time and in the same way. Did God change Nebuchadnezzar's will through brute force? Yes. Yes, he did. But th th we're also not told that um, while Nebuchadnezzar was eating. Uh, you know, grass that he did that of his own free will and rationally and that sort of thing. Right. Could God make a new king out of the rocks to that, that will do that of his own free will? Sure. Oh, oh wait, 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 that will do it of his own free will. Yeah. No, Can God keep no. making Kings until one of them does what he says the King's going to do? Yeah, like, in, God, what God, if they never do? You know, you know, on open theism, he God just doesn't know. He, he doesn't know any better. If it doesn't happen, you guys just say it was conditional. So if that king does not do what Daniel says is he's going to do, you just say, oh, it's conditional. Right, but God can create a thousand kings and a thousand and th first. It's like if God doesn't know what's going to happen, then he, you know, there's no guarantee that it's going to come So Daniel 12 could not happen, you, you say, in the open theist model. God doesn't have the power in open theism to bring about Daniel 12 
no matter what God does. Army of nanobots, God couldn't do it. No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible in your system. I would just say that it would require a lot of um, overriding free will. And I actually thought one thing that open theists and Arminians saw in common was um, that while God can override free will, he does it all the time. King of Sihon, Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar. But that's that's those are exceptions to the rule, not the general rule. Right. So what if he really wanted the prophecy to come true? then that is an option in open theism in which the open theist model fits, right? Right. I mean, God God could mind control everybody and, and do a puppet master thing to them. Um, I just don't think that that's what the Bible teaches us God does. And so we have to come up biblically with a, a better system to explain how he knows future free actions hundreds of years in advance than puppet mastering. Okay. Um, we're going to get to what well, was probably going to be the last question. I've got like a lot more. If you guys want to hang on like after the, the debate, I mean, we could go over a couple of these because some of these are just my personal ones. Um, but I, I will say that uh, oh, this last question is for the open theist. And whenever Dane was giving his closing, uh, I was kind of hit by something that he said. Um, and that's that Moses was a counselor to God. So, would would you say that like god takes counsel from humans um and if a man knows something like that god doesn't know or is telling him like god's upset and man has to cool him down like does that fit uh with the biblical view of god what are your thoughts on that so often in the bible people interact with god and give him suggestions and advice he has a divine counsel the divine counsel if you've ever heard of that in uh first kings second uh, kings 22 first kings 22 when he's trying to kill ahab he looks for advice to, in how to kill ahab and all these angels are in heaven and they all offer him various advices and then he picks the one he wants and so it's not like they're like giving him counsel like if you've ever watched lord of the rings and there's this like evil counselor whispering whispering in his ear no he's powerful and he's capable but that doesn't mean he doesn't listen to what people a want and listen to what people have to say and consider their input and then sometimes pick their input they're not they're not controlling god they're not leading him around the leash but he does care about our input he listens to our prayers should i go next <laughs> yeah you're next i actually kind of agree with what chris said there in, in a lot of ways i agree with much of what he said awesome <clears throat> so in theological debates, it's very easy to forget that God is a relational God. And if there's anything that, that we should all agree on that's true from the beginning of the Bible to the end, it's that God desires true relationship. Okay? Think of a relationship, and I don't think it's possible, a friendship, a marriage, anything, where one person uh, knows all, is always right, and doesn't take advice or counsel or even really listens with any reason to what the other person says. That's the worst relationship you could possibly imagine. And so because God is relational and because he desires that relationship with us, of course, he's going to listen to what we think, what we have to say, and take it into serious consideration. So I, uh, of course, agree that God is relational, very personal. I mean, he's he's a holy triune God, so he's relational even before he creates, right? Um, but our relationship to God is one of servant to master um, or, or subject to Lord. Um, and there is a sense in which we are also bride to Christ, um, but uh, Christ is our head. Um, so I don't think that it, it makes our relationship with God less sweet that we can't counsel him or, or teach him. Uh, I actually think it, it brings great comfort that we know in him we have a perfectly wise leader and a perfectly wise head um, that needs no counsel. Um, it's kind of like I have, a, I have a two-year-old and she really can't counsel me. Um, I have to direct her. So I think that um, that's a better picture for the relationship we have to God because his ways are higher than our ways. So I, 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 I got I, a two-year-old as well, and she says, Dad, let's go out for ice cream. I say, yeah, let's do that. 
Right. And, and of course, all metaphors fail, right? Because uh, our two year old is much closer to our intellect than we are to God's, right? We yeah. all agree with that. Yeah, I, I'll add a metaphor that'll fail as well. So let's take, for example, you know, somebody that's, uh, you know, in love with a woman and he's, he, they, they get engaged, right? And so he knows that he's going to marry her. Right. He knows that in the future. But then once it happens, the relationship changes. Right. And, and that's the sense in which God can know in advance that, you know, he's going to change. And, and in that sense, he, you know, it's not based on new information. He already knew that. But the relationship changes when the event happens. Well, I would argue that there is no true relationship where one party literally has no influence on the other one and where the other one will never take what they have to say in terms of of making up their mind or changing what they want to do so hmm. we're not determinists we're not calvinists i mean I, I think in some sense i agree with you yeah i mean i i could actually agree on a on a very basic level um that there is give and take between us and the lord i mean prayer is certainly um a powerful and mysterious way in which that occurs um, worship as well. I mean, we give to God. He is pleased by our worship, right? Um, but where I would draw the line is we don't teach God or counsel God or enlighten God. So the way we relate to God, in my perspective, what I see out of the scriptures is, um, you know, through prayer and worship, praise, um, faithfulness and obedience, not in, um, let me assume the role of teacher today and you learn from me, God. All right, we're going to close it up right there. It's 10.02. Um, so that was awesome, guys. I really enjoyed that. I think it was, uh, it was well worth it and edifying. Um, so uh, all, all of their information is linked in the description. So if you want to uh, catch some more uh, of their uh, stuff, their papers, their you know things they've written or uh, videos, whatever, check out links in the description. Um, and we'll go ahead and end it right there. So enjoyed it, guys. Y'all have a good night. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.